We've got some analysis for you on some of the major stories that have engaged people's attention throughout the week just gone by. First is a press conference on Monday uh, during which government ministers showcased two letters that they said indict Nanarodan Kwakufuado in a $1.1 million judgment debt payment. Has Nanado's stance been hypocritical, as they sought to suggest? Or should government back down from what some are describing as efforts at political equalization and deal with the substantive issues when it comes to judgment debts? Also, this week in Parliament, the uh, constitutional instrument that was supposed to bring into being the setup of the 45 new constituencies was laid. Or was it not? A big debate over whether or not it was laid. Later, a crunch meeting held to find common ground. Uh, but the suggestion is that the real issue, the real underlining factor is that something the majority seeks to gain from these new 45 constituencies, something the minority is just being difficult because they fear they will be at a disadvantage if these 45 new constituencies are brought into being. We'll get into the political analysis later this morning on News File. Also in Parliament, the Finance Minister was there to ask for some 2.61 billion Ghana cities more to support the budget for the year 2012. There are questions about uh, whether or not we are forecasting our nation's finances vigorously enough or uh, whether we're just being sloppy in how we handle our finances as a country. We'll get into that discussion later this morning on News File. And if we have some time, we'll talk about campaign launches and slogans. It's interesting, the NDC and the MPP are both launching on August the 25th, we are told, and now it seems they both have the same slogan. People matter, you matter. Is anyone plagiarizing the other's slogan? And would this have any effect on the 2012 electioneering campaign? Let's start off with uh, the very first subject. And earlier this week, uh, government ministers held a press conference uh, during which they showcased two letters ostensibly to indict Nanaudan Kwakufuado for being hypocritical when it comes to the subject of judgment debts. Um, I'll be asking a few questions after you've had a look at this quick playback of that press conference. These two letters are revealing as they are interesting. They prove that one, Mr. Kufwado is no stranger to the payment of judgment debts in other words, he is not exonerated in any way. Two, it is a fact that after assuming office as Attorney General and Minister for Justice in 2001, one of Mr. Kufwado's first legal actions to the state was to recommend the payment of settlement as evidenced by his letter dated 18 April 2001. He even went beyond settlements by simply agreeing with the petition from the solicitors of Great Cape without any further negotiations or court processes. Akufuado and his acolytes tell the Ghanaian public that judgment debts connote corruption and that in the most unlikely event as president, he will rather use judgment debts to finance his unrealistic free senior high school pledge. But unknown to the Ghanaian public, as recent as only nine months ago, he had been busily advocating behind the scenes that the Great Cape Company of Switzerland be paid an, um, an additional 1,117,818 dollars and 45 cents in what he calls Great Cape's, quote, legitimate claims. Even 10 years after Akufuado left office, he believes fervently that the Great Cape Company of Switzerland has a legitimate claim against the state. Indeed, he is not only being faithful to the Great Cape Company, but also he states in writing in 3rd October 2011 that, quote, it will be unconscionable on the part of government to defeat legitimate claims of its creditors. Well, from the letters, Nana Kufado did not try to settle a judgment debt. He gave an opinion on a petition that had been addressed to him officially. And he gave his opinion. The matter of judgment debt is very simple. When the matter is legitimate, there's no problem. 
when the matter can be demonstrated to be illegitimate, unfounded, and that people have compromised by their conduct. That is where there's the problem. And the cases clearly show this, this, this trend. You have Wyoming, where the courts of Ghana ruled that don't pay the money, and government still goes ahead to pay. What compares to that? 24 after 9, this is News File. Felix, I want to start with you. Was the objective achieved? Absolutely. And indeed, it was exactly a week ago on this program. Indeed, the Honorable Deputy Minister for Information was sitting right in the seat that I'm sitting in today. And he said that the next installment in what we have dubbed the Sunlight Campaign, which, which aims to shed further light on the phenomenon of judgment debt payment, uh, would be exceedingly interesting. Those were his exact words. I've noticed that, of course, after the event, uh, some spokespersons of the MPP have attempted to water down the effect by creating the impression that somehow the deputy minister said he was going to indict Nana Akufuado for wrongdoing. And so they've, they've consistently stated that Nanado has not been involved in any wrongdoing. I don't think that the minister said that we're going to show that Nanado had been involved in wrongdoing. What he said was that we're going to reveal another dimension of this debate that hitherto was unknown to the Ghanaian public. So on Monday, the press conference did take place at 2 p.m. And the minister, or the deputy minister, I beg your pardon, read out two letters, which show that contrary to the public posturing of uh, members of the NPP, um, Nana Akufuado is not a stranger to the payment of judgment debt. Indeed, he canvassed strongly for judgment debt to be paid to certain entities that were making claims as far as uh, grievances that they, ha they had against the uh, state uh, were concerned. There's a letter dated 18th April 2001 in which Anado uh, asserts that based on representations made to him by the Great Cape Company Limited and having examined the documents that they've provided him, he's of the opinion that they are entitled to be paid an additional 11 years, uh, if you like, uh, compensation. Uh, you see, in this particular matter, I've, I've noticed that subsequently M MPP spokespersons have tried to go into the history and all that. That, that history is, in my view, not relevant to the discussion. Nanadu says that his predecessor, Dr. Abel Samoa, agreed to settle uh, the matter with Great Cape. So the company itself brought out what it felt were the monies that it was entitled to, up to 1998, I believe. No, up to 1987, I believe. So they were paid, and <coughs> it was thought at the time that that was the final payment on that particular matter. So the matter uh, was going to uh, 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 be allowed to rest. Now, subsequently, Great Cape comes and says that, no, we made a mistake in the calculation. Indeed. There's an additional 11 years payment that we, we failed to factor in our initial calculation. So they bring the documents, and Nanado says, okay, I've looked at the documents. Nanado doesn't uh, go to court as the MPP has, has made us believe that he, set, he went to court to challenge every claim that was brought to his table. He asked that the people be paid uh, what, what, what can best be described as enhanced uh, claims of up to 11 years. So this was done. Now, subsequently, when Nanado left office, and indeed the NDC government, came into power, a uh, great keep made contact with government and demanded that they were owed an additional 11 years payment that, that was not factored into the initial calculation. Uh, incidentally, it does appear that the documents on this particular uh, case could not be traced at either the Ministry of Finance or the Attorney General's uh, office. So it was difficult to ascertain the veracity of the claims that uh, the Great Cape Company Limited was making. Dr. Nat Tano, who appears to be the country representative of Great Cape, then remembers that Nanado once dealt with the matter, and Nanado is around. So he writes to him, asking him to attend, because indeed, Dr. Tano also produced a letter. I think this letter that Nanado wrote to the ministry as evidence that indeed they were entitled to those payments. The ministry then said that it was important for them to have some sort of confirmation from Nanado to authenticate uh, the signature. So Dr. Tano then writes to Nanado, and Nanado actually says that, yes, the signature is his. But you see, Narado did not leave this at just authentication. He goes ahead to make an impassioned plea in the letter. Indeed, he takes it upon himself to write to the Ministry of Finance and the Attorney General at the time, demanding or indeed asking them or employing them, if you like, that indeed Great Cape Company Limited was entitled to those payments and so they should be paid. Now, if you just oppose this action that Narado took against what MPP leading functionaries have said, that judgment debt connotes corruption, and that judgment debt represented misplaced priorities. 
and that instead of paying judgment debt, they would rather fund, fund their, their, their deeply flawed senior high school proposals with the monies that otherwise would have gone into the payment of judgment debt. They have practically condemned government. They have also said that whenever companies bring claims before government, government does not take steps to ascertain the veracity of the claim. Government just goes ahead, invites them, and pays them. Government doesn't go to court. Government opts to settle. They even create the impression that the government just goes onto the streets and invites people to pay them judgment debt and what have you. So these letters laid bare the duplicity and the hypocrisy that has attended the MPP's approach to a discussion on the issue of judgment debt. So that is precisely what the press conference was aimed at. It was aimed at shedding light on some of these matters. So the Ghanaians are clear in their mind that what the MPP is saying is at variance with what they do behind the scenes. Because another wrote these letters, Nicodemus, they were, they, were, they were never made public. He wrote them behind the scenes on the quiet and, 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 and asked the government officials to pay judgment debts and what have you. I mean, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, for instance, when he held his, his much vaunted press conference, sorry, uh, lecture on the Ghanaian economy, he, he, he equated judgment debt payments to corruption. Indeed, he went as far as suggesting that merely because judgment debt has been paid, uh, the economy has been run down. If you look at the reports that followed, I have seen the reports on PCFM online, 3rd May 2012, in which they say judgment debt is corruption, attributed to Dr. Baumia. We've not had any, uh, if you like, uh, response from Dr. Baumia. We've not had any rejoinder. So it stands to reason that those uh, uh, represented the views of Dr. Mahadu Baumia. So it is clear that the MPP has not been fair to the people of Ghana. They have not been candid with the people of this country. And that rather than seeing judgment debt payments as a challenge to the nation as a whole and, and contributing to the debate, making valid inputs that can help us shape the system such that we are able to avoid, first of all, the incurrence of these judgment <coughs> debts, and also we are able to strengthen institutions that will be able to, 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 to work in a manner that ensures that the interest of the state is protected at, at all times. The MPP has sought to politicize it. They've sought to bastardize uh, President Mills and the NDC regime. They've created the impression that merely paying judgment debts amounts to corruption. Another point that comes out clearly in these letters is that when the African Automobile Limited issue broke out and the Isofoton issue broke out, the impression was created that because government spokespersons and indeed the Deputy Minister of Information had made certain facts bare in the light of blatant falsehoods that were being peddled by MPP officials, then he and other spokespersons that, have spoke, that had spoken in that manner had become, uh, if you like, representatives of Africa Automobile Limited and Isofoton. Indeed, we were accused of protecting private interests against the state's interest. And we, will, we received a lot of flack from unsuspecting members of the public. It turns out that this is Nanado saying that it is unconscionable that government of Ghana's own inadequacies should prevent the payment of legitimate claims owed to uh, the Great Cape Company Limited. So the reason, that the question needs to be asked, is it possible to set out the facts as they are, even if it favors a private entity without undermining the interests of the state. If it were the case, how is it then that the MPP unfairly bastardized government spokespersons who were simply setting out the facts as they were and called as names? You recall how suddenly a phrase stealers has been coined by uh, Sheikh Isikwe to describe persons who have even commented on this matter on the side of government. So how is it that the MPP uses one standard to measure themselves and applies an entirely different standard to measure uh, 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 those of us in government. And again, there's a, there's a, a part of this statement that I would like to read. It, it sums up <coughs> the points that I have raised in that the MPP has been judgmental. They have failed to address the issues as they are and have sought to profit from it. Now, I read this portion. It says, ladies and gentlemen, unlike the NPP, we would not rush in passing judgment on the letters written by Nana Akufuado, I must stress, except that we would like to ask based on the MPP's logic, whether the MPP will call representatives of Great Cape Company fraudulent or label them cronies of the MPP flag bearer, Akufuado. Would the MPP accuse Akufuado of betraying the people of Ghana? Would the MPP accuse Akufuado of only being concerned with foreign business interests with the intention of receiving kickbacks? Would the MPP call him a debt collector or a debt engineer? Will Sheikh Aisikwe call Akufuado a stealer? Now, could you, I noticed that after this issue broke out, suddenly the MPP has made a U-turn. I have heard numerous spokespersons, and need a multiplicity of leading functionaries of the MPP, say that they have never said that there was anything wrong with judgment debt payments. And that all that they have said is that legitimate payments should be made. Indeed, I heard Nana Akumia in the inset that, that, that you played. 
saying that once the payment is legitimate, they are okay with it. But that, the, the, their conduct over the period has not justified the position that they are holding now. You recall what has happened in the CP matter, for instance, the Isofoton case, the Africa Automobile Limited case. They have sought to create the impression that somehow Madame Betty Modigliso just sanctioned illegal payments to CP. When they are fully aware that that action that Madame Betty Modigliso took was based on an arbitral award that CP had won. An arbitral award that the MPP is fully aware of. Because as far back as 2006, this award was addressed to the, the, the Mr. Ayuko Otu, who was then Attorney General of Ghana. So the MPP is aware that CP had a legitimate claim. They then began processes to ensure that that claim is settled. Indeed, after the arbitral award, several meetings were held, some involving President Kufo himself. Uh, Dr. Antonio Akutu in 2008 signed a warrant asking CP to be paid $40 million uh, 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 dollars as condition precedent for settlement of the claims as contained in the arbitral award. Yet, you see the circles that has transpired at the Public Accounts Committee where unnecessary time has been wasted. They create the impression that somehow there was something fraudulent about the CP payment. You've heard the minority leader, and I'm particularly disappointed in him, because once a matter goes before parliament, public accounts committee, you expect that people who belong to that institution refrain from making prejudicial statements. But he has, a he has been at the forefront of calling Madame Betty Modibisu names, calling President Mills names, saying that there was fraudulent fraud in the payment of the CP award. You've seen how Azeke Siyama has consistently bastardized Madame Betty Modigliso and called her name. So even when there are legitimate claims that have been paid by the NDC government, the MPP has still insisted. And that's that, why you accuse them of double standards. Absolutely, absolutely. And that is the, the, the government of the press conference that was held on Monday. I've moderated a lot of discussions on this judgment debt saga. And one thing that comes out very clearly, for me, even the more predominant thing, is you hear a lot of Ghanaians saying, we are not comfortable with how this whole umbrella of... of, of of judgment debts has become one under which payments that we don't quite understand are being made. And we will want to see and hear government spend time, probably fully investigate and bring some people to account on that. And then we have this press conference that puts out these statements and you know takes pot shots of Nanado. Some therefore say you are just trying to do political equalization when the substantive question that the people of Ghana are asking when it comes to judgment debt is not being answered. Well, I disagree with that position. You recall that as far back as December, 2011. Indeed, in an interview with Radio Gold, President Mills made a point that it is important in these discussions to even go back. You see, it is not proper to start at the end point where people have been paid. It is important for us to go back and understand how the debts came about in the first place. When President Mills made that submission, immediately he was dumped upon by MPP functionaries and criticized for seeking to shield wrongdoers. Now, when government began releasing these, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, this information concerning how the judgment debts came about. For instance, in the Africa Automobile Limited case and in the Asifuton case, immediately people started accusing us of seeking to score political points, when indeed it was the case that we were bringing to light uh, 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 things that had happened. It is true that there are certain individuals who cannot escape blame in this whole, uh, what do you call it, uh, affair. In the Asifuton case, for instance, it is absolutely clear that government officials acted in a manner that exposed the country to legal action, legal action that indeed was taken and which resulted in the payments or in the incurrence of some liability, for which reason the government of Ghana has to part with 1.3 million uh, dollars to settle Isofoton's claims. In the Africa Automobile Limited, it is clear that there were valid contracts that were abrogated. And you see, my, my worry is the lack of candor, the lack of integrity that has been displayed by former government officials, where it is clear there is concrete proof that there was a contract. They all come and say there is no contract. When they are even challenged and the contracts are made avail available, they still Disputed. Look at Mr. Jogati's conduct in the Isofotin matter. He writes a letter which is clear and lucid, which shows that indeed the action that government took was detrimental to the interests of the state. Somehow he contrives another explanation and comes to tell us that after he had written that letter in 2008, he had a change of mind and went to court in November 2008, at a time when Isofotin had already gotten a default judgment. If you look at the defense that Mr. Jogati sent to court, you know right away that it cannot master scrutiny because indeed in the face of overwhelming evidence from the Spanish government itself there was no way that a matter yes, but Felix, was to going to happen. you yes you are spending a lot of time on what the NPP past officials may or may not have done how mm -hmm. about the questions that the people of Ghana asking mm -hmm. that this whole thing needs to be dealt with and needs to be tidied up is that being responded to absolutely I, and indeed many civil society organizations and some political figures have made that call I endorse those calls for a full-blown inquiry so well, where is the response to that? Directly? Well, you must, from could government. You, could you, you must, as far back as December 2011, President Mills instructed Yoko 
to, apart from investigating the whale matter as, 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 as just one incident, go into the whole issue of judgment. So there's a whole raft of investigations that are going on. As I sit here, I cannot tell you off the top of my head where they've got into, but I'm sure if you did some checks at the place, they will apprise you of uh, how, how far they've come as far as the investigations are concerned. So those concerns are legitimate. Government takes it on board. And indeed, this exercise that we are doing helps the public understand. Because see that too, it was perceived that the mere mention of judgment that connoted corruption. corruption. And I think and that's that what you are seeking to clear. Absolutely. It's important that we clear yeah, that's that. And government is committed to, uh, to double to standards. Right that's the charge. Well, I, uh, thank you. Um, I, I disagree. And I think uh, particularly in respect uh, of um, Nana Kufado, um, I don't think that there's uh, any issue of double standards. But the fact is that um, words have been put into his mouth uh, in order that the claim of double standards can be canvassed. Uh, the point is, if you say that Ekufuadu has said that um, he doesn't pay judgment debts, or his um, uh, associates have said that he doesn't pay judgment debts, then of course, if it comes out that uh, he has paid judgment debts as Attorney General, uh, or has, has, has um, recommended that judgment debts be paid as Attorney General, then of course, he's being insincere. Um, if you say that the Kufuadu says, well, he will not use, he will not pay judgment debts, but he will use the money to fund SHS, uh, his HHS program. Um, and of course, it comes out that he has recommended paying judgment debts in the past. Then of course, he, he, he's not being a candid. But that's the, precisely the point. I mean, he has never said any of those things. And I think um, for somebody of his caliber, I mean, in terms of uh, being a lawyer, it would be strange if a Kufuadu would say anywhere that I will not pay judgment debts. Because one, a judgment debt is essentially uh, a debt that has been come about because of a court uh, ruling. And if you respect the rule of law, you cannot, as a government functionary, say the court has ordered us to pay this amount to uh, uh, um, a plaintiff, but we will not pay. I think anybody who knows a Kufuado and knows his record as a lawyer will not even, will just laugh that off. It's, it's just not going to happen. Um, that's the first point. The second point is that I think what he has said is that Woyome, the Woyome matter, would not have happened under his presidency. Now, is he justified in saying so? I think so. I think the Woyome matter is a matter in which somebody, the government alleges that Mr. Woyome has been paid money that he doesn't deserve because he uh, defrauded uh, uh, the state. And if a Kufuadu says, well, that will not happen in, under my watch, I think he's quite uh, entitled to that. And, but that doesn't mean that uh, he's saying nobody should pay judgment debts. I think anybody who has been in government, as long as a Kufuadu has or in public life, knows that as long as it's human beings that are running the state, uh, there are going to be some um, issues of, um, uh, that require compensation. Uh, a lot may not even have to do with contracts per se with government, but simply uh, torts, for example, where if a government, uh, somebody goes into a government building, slips and falls, occupies liability, they have to pay compensation. Uh, a policeman uh, uh, knocks somebody down with his motorcycle or a car, uh, you don't expect that person to take care of themselves. They, they might go to court if there's no settlement, it will result in a judgment somebody has to pay. And, and so I think it is, it is uh, sort of giving a dog uh, a bad name in order to hang it. This is the situation we find ourselves in. I think the whole press conference was completely unnecessary, especially when uh, the prelude to the press conference was that uh, we all heard Mr. Ablakwa suggest that um, he was going to present some information on another judgment debt that would blow our minds. Now, I think in the context of <laughs> what is happening today, if somebody says, uh, we're going to, on Monday, we're going to have a press conference, and we're going to present information. I think the, the exact words he used was, that will blow everybody's mind. Uh, then, of course, we expect that um, we're going to be presented with another gargantuan judgment debt. As it turns out, it wasn't even a judgment debt. This whole Great Cape Company matter was not a judgment debt. It was a matter in which a company, <coughs> I think it's important. Um, I, I understand uh, Mr. Fusukwachi to suggest that the background is not important. But the background is always important. In one breath, he says the president in 2011 suggested that the background to all of these is important. And now he sits here and says the background to the Great Cape Company is irrelevant, is immaterial. <laughs> That's very strange to me. But I think it's important. First of all, this Great Cape Company um, had a contract with the government of Ghana in 1978 to supply clinker, which is what is used in making cement. 
there was a change of government. I think the palace coup of uh, Akufu, General Akufu, in which he uh, put um, aside Mr. General Achampo, uh, and the, comp the contract was abrogated. The company kept um, uh, pressing uh, for damages, uh, for breach of contract. The government set up a uh, committee of inquiry in which they agreed to pay them 400,000 uh, US dollars in compensation. That apparently was never paid. Uh, in the Liman era, uh, interventions were made, representations were made on behalf of the company. Nothing happened, even though they kept promising to pay. In the PNDC era, in 1987, the government then agreed to pay interest on the sum, agreed that it was a legitimate claim, and agreed to pay interest on the sum of 8.5% uh, per year. That also didn't get paid, so that by 1997, the debt had ballooned to 2,044,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, in 1998, the government paid 937,000 US dollars, uh, which was not uh, uh, adequate because of the 2 million. Now, apparently, the interest calculations too were not done properly by the company, not the government's uh, fault. The company petitioned um, the government at the time in 1999, uh, bringing up this matter of a balance of payments uh, that was due them. The Solicitor General at the time, and I think, I think Dr. Obed Asama was Attorney General, um, the Solicitor General at the time was given the, the brief to look at. They assessed it and determined that it was a correct uh, position for the company to take and that the company was indeed owed <coughs> those arrears. Now, and they agreed to pay. Once again, uh, it wasn't paid and the, there was a change of government. When um, Kufuadu became um, uh, uh, Attorney General in 2001, uh, by then uh, Dr. Tano, who was representing the Great Cape Company, had hired Chichi Opoku, uh, the lawyer, to uh, represent the company. Now, he wrote to both the Attorney General and the Minister of Finance. In fact, the, the letters are identical, uh, in which um, he, he, he bemoaned the long uh, delay in payments to the company and the, the problems the company had had and the fact that the company had made several concessions in waiving all sorts of claims in order to get a quick settlement and how uh, this had still not happened. Um, Kufuadu wrote to the Minister of Finance uh, indicating that this petition had come to him, that, that the petition was a repeat of a petition that had been brought in 1999 during Dr. Obera Samwa's tenure. He had looked at the documents, his office had examined uh, the documents and found that the, the claim was legitimate and that um, uh, the outstanding balance of $1.1 million thereabouts ought to be paid to the company. That was, that was where he left it. Now, apparently that didn't get paid either. So in 2009, when the, um, uh, uh, 2011, beg your pardon, uh, when uh, there had been a change of government, Dr. Tano again petitioned the ministries of finance and the attorney general's department in order to sort out the balance. Um, but apparently there were no records uh, of, uh, of that particular matter. But because Dr. Tano had the letters um, that he had written and had received on the matter over the years. He was able to produce a Kufuado's letter. <coughs> and he was told by the Minister of Finance that, look, um, if you can get a Kufuado to authenticate his signature, that in fact he had written the letter, then we can move on from there. In fact, the Ministry of Finance got advice from the legal department of the ministry, and which uh, suggested that it is not unheard of for that to happen, that there are instances in which if there's no paper trail, but there is a letter uh, or some sort of uh, document. If it can be authenticated, uh, it can prov be uh, proved to be the basis for uh, moving forward. Um, so in 2011, uh, September, um, Dr. Tano wrote to Nane Kufuado um, requesting that he authenticate the letter that he had written in 2001 endorsing the position of Dr. Obeda Samoa in 1999. Um, Kufuado responded, and, and this is what's, uh, I think, quite interesting. Uh, you know, you see clearly his public spiritedness because the first part of his letter, uh, he says, you know, uh, he was surprised that um, uh, such a request would come to him uh, because um, uh, it was, an, he called it an unusual request uh, because he was surprised that um, government records could not be found and that he found it strange that uh, record keeping government had gone to such straits that uh, this uh, request to him would be necessary. And then he also suggested that, you know, um, it would be wrong for government to use its own deficiencies, that is, its poor record keeping in this instance, to avoid paying a legitimate claim. I mean, this is the, the portion of his letter that has been quoted ad nauseum by uh, 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 government spokespersons and the like, that uh, he, he stated that it would be unconscionable 
for government to um, uh, refuse to pay uh, based on its own uh, wrong. And that is, uh, of course, uh, uh, an equitable maxim that all lawyers know. That but you I've, cannot heard, I've heard a lot of MPP people since this discussion of judgment that started say that because there's room sometimes for manipulation, because there are you know, confusing points, it is best as a first resort to go to court to argue out instead of settling. Because the argument has been made that it's when we decide to settle that all sorts of funny things happen behind the scenes. And one of the arguments that's been put out by MPP communicators is that you should therefore, when these things come up, as much as possible, go to court and try and argue it out. Now, holding on to that same argument, so in 2001, when they bring up these things, and even if there's a solicitor general's comment, I think the question that the uh, government communicators are asking is that why is it that in that same spirit, Nanado doesn't you know, decide maybe to um, uh, 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 you know, head to the courts and challenge that sort of extra claim that is being made, or even in 2011, when uh, that authentication request is made of him, advise that that should be done. And, 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 and then suggest that, well, this is legitimate, so let's pay. And they are arguing that it's the same premise on which they also argue that some other claims are legitimate and therefore must be paid. Um, well, first of all, um, I don't know what NPP communicators have been saying, but I can tell you for a fact that that would not be a co-father's position. I mean, no lawyer worth his salt is going to encourage his client to go to court on a matter that they're clearly going to lose. And on this matter itself, I mean, government would have been so estopped in so many instances, there's so many documents oh, from 1978 to 2001 for government to have been stopped from claiming that they didn't owe, for Ekufuado to advise the government to go to court for the sake of it. No, I don't think that's uh, Ekufuado's position at all. And I, I know for a fact he would never take that position. What Ekufuado is concerned about is that there seems to be uh, a position taken by government to settle claims that government can actually fight and win. That is the, that is the difficulty. Take, for example, the African automobile case that recently went to the Supreme Court, in which the African automobile company was claiming uh, compensation or, or, or damages for a breach of contract on a servicing uh, of vehicles uh, claim. Here, the, 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 the high court that had heard the matter came to the conclusion that there was no contract at all, and that, if anything, uh, for on a quantum merit basis, the company would be owed something like $1,500. Now, a government representative comes to court to say that the, the, <laughs> the, the, the government is amenable to judgment being entered for African automobile to the tune of 14 million. I mean, that's outrageous. That is what we're talking about. I think if you, if you look at most of the judgment, so-called judgment debt uh, matters that have come up in the public domain, very, very few of them, in fact, apart from Wyoming, I can't think of any one of them that was actually a judgment debt properly so-called. Unfortunately, in the, in, the, in the circumstances in which we find ourselves as a country, we're now equating even, even settled claims as judgment debts. And that in itself is a problem. Mm. Because uh, if, you, if nothing goes to court, it cannot be a judgment debt. And I think a lot of these, these matters that, that have come into the public domain have not actually been to court. They've been the result of settlement. And Ekufuado has said that he doesn't understand why some of these claims can clearly be fought and won, and yet they go to court. I think we should be very careful about you know, banding default judgments about as though, um, um, you know, you, 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 somebody has, has, it means that somebody has a, 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 a veritable claim. Mm. A default judgment is simply comes about when the defendant <coughs> does not go to court to fight the case. It doesn't mean the plaintiff has a strong case at all. And so if Isofoton had a default judgment, it doesn't mean Isofoton had a good case. In any event, I'm also surprised that people would even talk about Joe Gatti's opinion and advice rendered to the Ministry of Finance on the Isofoton case, okay? And that uh, today, if, uh, if Joe Gatti says that, you know, I, I got further information and realized that the position I took was not the correct position, why should that not be believed? Especially when government, I'm told, paid quite a bit of money, thousands of dollars, to a professional group to look into the matter, and their recommendation was that, indeed, Isofoton was not owed any money, and that they, they had no contract that could be enforced. Okay? Now, if you, if you look at that, I think it seems to me that that's consistent with Jogarty's position. But let me, let me for me, I'm here to um, uh, speak about this uh, press conference and this uh, uh, matter of Akufado. I think it has become very clear that, you know, you cannot, this was just another attempt to sort of pull Akufado into this whole judgment debt thing and this mess that government appears to have 
uh, gotten themselves into. And I, it's not the first time. Right after this government came to power, it tried to tar Kufuado with the brush of corruption. First of all, it had to do with a car that he was driving, uh, uh, that he was using, which they say he didn't pay duty on. It turns out he did not import the car. It was not his car. He bought it from somebody else who had imported it, et cetera, et cetera. They have combed through all of the files at the ministries of, uh, of, of uh, foreign affairs, the ministry of justice, to find something on the Kufuado. It doesn't happen. So today, it is the Great Cape Company now, it seems to me that what all that the Great Cape Company saga shows is that Akufuado is incorruptible, that he's honest, he's a public-spirited person who will do the right thing. He didn't come and say, well, this contract, I see Dr. Natano's name here. This is Guzitano's brother. Why should I even help uh, uh, to, to, to give an opinion right or wrong? Uh, I see that the lawyer is Chichwe Opoku. Ah, Reform Party, NDC. Why should I bother myself? Truth is why he should bother himself, and that's what he did. He looked into the matter and came to the conclusion that of all the work that had been done over the years, everything to him seemed above board. Akufuado is not infallible. He could make mistakes. But everything seemed to him to be above board, and he endorsed it. If it is his signature <coughs> on a letter, he's not, he could have very said, look, I really would rather not get involved in this matter. You know, sorry if they can't find the records, have them look uh, more, more, more diligently. I don't want to get involved. Mm. But I think a <coughs> as a mark of a person of great, great uh, character and, and truth and honesty, he came across uh, uh, saying that, look, this is indeed my signature, and um, I don't see any reason why government should use its own lapses to not pay legitimate claims. Now, um, I think um, one of the, I just want to uh, end by saying this, that there were several mistakes, you know, and this is what, for me, points to the mischief of this whole press conference. First of all, Mr. Blackwa called it a judgment debt matter. It's not a judgment debt matter. Secondly, Mr. Blackwa said Akufuado just took a petition from the solicitors of Great Cape without doing anything else and simply decided to pay. Well, that is not true. Even in the letter that they, they quote themselves, Akufuado says very clearly that, the, uh, subsequently, and I quote, subsequently upon a petition by the company, our office looked at the case again and upheld the representation of the company to the effect that the interest due them should have been computed to the time of payment in 1998 and not 1987 which was the time the original calculation was due. The mistake occurred because when the matter came up after 1997, the company did not submit all of the data which were subsequently incorporated in their letter of 6 September. So that now, doesn't hold water as well. Now, it doesn't <coughs> hold water, and more importantly, he says, the company acting through solicitors has filed another petition to us. The first one was to Dr. Obed Asamoah's office, uh, well, to the AG's office, but when Dr. Asamoah was there. And the contents are similar to the earlier petition dated 6 September. Having examined it, I agree with the recommendations contained in the letter of the Solicitor General, not of the solicitors of the Great Cape Company. So I think that is also something that should be cleared up and because it, it sort of uh, distorts the, 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 the facts. It makes it seem as though all he did was receive information from the, uh, the, the, the solicitors and he decided to uh, act on it. Okay. Now, finally, uh, I think Mr. Um, Ablakwa also posed some questions, rhetorical questions, I thought. I think Mr. Fusukwachi has also uh, brought it up uh, to the effect that whether or not a Kufuado um, <laughs> was conniving with commies, whether yeah. it should well, be called. Well, let me let me just say that I think I think neither a Kufuado nor anybody in the MPP can call the representatives of the Great Cape Company fraudulent because they have no basis to do so. They have no basis at all. A Kufuado uh, cannot be labeled a crony of the representatives of the Great Cape Company because he never met with them. He never even met with them. Doesn't know them. Never met with them. Um, no one can accuse Akufuado of betraying Ghana. I think his public record speaks for itself. You see, Akufuado's letter of 2001, if he was somebody interested in the company, why didn't he call the Minister of Finance to follow up like Ablakwa did? Let me ask a question. When the people of Isofoton went to see Mr. Ablakwa in his office and he said they brought him a petition, did Ablakwa know whether that petition, the contents of it, were legit or not? When he picked up the phone to call the Attorney General, to ask him whether, why he hadn't paid. Three minutes. You, you understand me? <laughs> Three minutes to 10 on news file. Nana Santipideto has just been responding to uh, some of my questions. Let me come to Mutala Mohammed. The argument here is that, listen, stop playing coy politics with this. You know what the real issue is? The real issue here is that people are not comfortable with how these judgment debts or how these settlement payments are being made. They want to see that resolved. These pot shots at Nanado don't necessarily answer that question for people. Could you, first and foremost, the response to the, the, the last question or statement made by Nana with regards to Okujeto 
and Nana Akufado. I think that the, the simple answer is that Nana Akufado was the legal advisor of the government. Okujuto is a deputy minister of information. It is very clear, even on joy, that their country representative indicated that they went to the Ministry of Information looking for the substantive minister. And indeed, what Samuel, uh, Honorable Okujuto did was to find out not the content or the merit of the demands that they were making. And that point <coughs> was made very clearly. Here is a minister of justice and attorney general who wrote a letter. So I'm surprised that he's trying to compare the, the, the telephone call <laughs> Honorable Okujoto made with regards to people have come to complain. And as government, if in governance, if you are working for a government, someone comes with a claim, what is wrong with you trying to find out from a colleague minister? This is a concern that someone has brought. I want to find out from you what is wrong with that. And again, even Ernest sitting here, like he indicated, was to more or less clarify certain issues. I think that he has done a lot of disservice to Nana Kufadu's issue with regards to all this press conference that was held. In one breath, he says that Nana Kufadu, a lawyer of a sort, would not want to advise his client to go to court when he knows that he's going to court on a case that he can win. The same lawyer of a sort knows that when a case is in court, you don't comment on the content or if like the merit of the case. Yet he commented on Woyumi. I think that let's, let's move away from this. And he did that with a style. He did that in Woyumi's own hometown when he knew that the Woyumi case was in court. And I think that we need to move away. This desperate attempt, attempt please, it's not about what he said. He, 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 he exactly. You're talking, you're benefited from the money. You're, you're, you're the the issue, about, please, you're please. About, you're talking you see, about I, subject. I, I, I'm just asking a question. Please, I listen to you. You just have the patience. No, I don't worry. I'm just asking a question. Please, 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 please. I'm saying it's that he said, he asked the people of his hometown whether they also benefited from the money. The whole issue of the Wemi case had to do with the money. He went there and commented on it. So I think the same, the same Nana Kufado, who is a lawyer of a sort, who is a lawyer of a sort, on BBC said that, as I talked to you, a whistleblower is in court. You think that a lawyer of a sort will make a statement about something that is non-existent? As I talked to you, a whistleblower in Ghana is in jail. He said, as I talked to you, a whistleblower in Ghana is in jail. When he knew, deep down him, that there was no whistleblower in jail. I think that this desperate attempt wouldn't help. In fact, it has even, he, has, he has succeeded in messing up the issue. And I thought that Nana Okumiya would have been better. But another point he made. I will not take please, personal insults from you. Oh, have I insulted you? Yeah, <laughs> I will not. If, 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 we can be very civil. If you're angry, I'm sorry. I, I don't intend to. I will not gentlemen. take that from you. And I think that let's, I let's, that's why I don't <laughs> let's, let's, let's proceed. Gentlemen, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that somebody will be better. Let's focus on the issues. It's OK. It's OK. It's OK. Let's focus on the issues. We will do that. Let me ask my question again. The argument is that there are substantive questions that people are asking. Yeah. These attempt to draw in Nanado don't necessarily answer those questions for taxpayers who want to know how best to deal with settlement claims and maybe judgment debts moving on into the future. The, that question. the attempt to draw in His Excellency the President and the wife, claiming that the wife benefited $5 million do or Ghana cities from monies that were paid to Wyoming, in which NPP leadership and commentators commented about was it also fair? Who was that? Yeah. When, yes. When, when, when this guy held the press conference, or what was the name? That gentleman in Fonka, and said that Nana Akufo... Who was that? Who was that? The, that was Osubempa. Osubempa. And said that the wife, His Excellency President Millis' wife, got five million, uh, million, million Ghana cities, was it five million dollars, from this women. Most of their commentators commented on it. They commented on it. And they thought it was the right thing to comment on. And I think that let's, let, who is trying to draw Nana Kufado even into this whole debate? The fact is that the press conference was held to expose the hypocrisy. That was the purpose. And again, there was another argument that was made. That even at the press conference, the Deputy Minister of Information said that they are not saying that Nana Kufado is, 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 is engaged in any, in any wrongdoing. That was not the purpose for the press conference. The purpose for the press conference was made very clear. We want people to understand that we should not politicize judgment debt. <coughs> now you had the, the, the running mate, Dr. Mahmoud, who said that payment of judgment debt was corruption. Simple and short. Now if someone says the payment of judgment debt is corruption, simple and short, yet in one breath, you are also, you've, also, you've also paid judgment debt. And your actions and inactions suggest something entirely different. My, my brother read the letter that was written on the 18th of April, 2001. 
And he said that Nana Kufadu didn't just say that. We think that you should. Why? These people went to court. They were paid. And mind you, Kojo, they went to court with an argument. And the argument they went to court was, we demand this amount of money to be paid. He himself indicated here that the calculation, which was wrongly done, was not done by government, but it was done by the company. Now, the court ruled on the argument that was made by this company in court, and for which reason the amount of money was paid. Now, these same people would come back and say that, we think that about 11 years calculation of interest should have been added to it. 11 years. Now, 11 years, as a minister of justice and attorney general, why? It, it has to do with the state paying money. You didn't see the need to go to court. You just decided that I am convinced with the argument that is made by these people and therefore they should be paid. Now, you see, the point we are trying to, to, to make very clear has to do with the hypocrisy. Now, if you listen to the MPP, and I'm surprised that they are now saying that Nana Kufado as a person never made that statement, and that if he didn't even hear MPP commentators comment on this issue of the fact that they will not rush into paying judgment debt, they would fight every single case in court. And we said this is a classical example that the government and then Nana Kufado, who is now the flag bearer of the party, should have fought in court, and he didn't do that. Now, he made another point that, that he, they were talking about <coughs> cases that you think that government can easily win. And therefore, they don't understand why government wouldn't go and fight those cases. They will rush into paying judgment. I think that we need to delink this politics with issues of judgment. Because clearly, as a developing nation, and as long as officials of government appointees, whether in NDC or in MPP, behave the manner that many of them behave, will continuously have this particular challenge, which will be confronted with. Another very important <coughs> point that I think that ought to be made. You see, the availability of the authentication, if you like, of your signature. Nana could have just written to authenticate the signature. You can't tell me. Writing that is unconscionable. It's unconscionable that it will be unconscionable on the part of government if its own poor record keeping is used to defeat legitimate claims of its creditors. The, even if those records, if the documents were available, it's not a justification that the claims that the people were making were justified. The fact that you didn't have records and therefore, you needed to have government owns for keeping of records. They couldn't get a record. And on that basis, you think that the people claim is legitimate. The fact that the records, the, the, the records were not available, even if the records are available, that itself is not a proof that the claim they are making is a legitimate claim. I think that Nana Kufado could have just written, authenticating that, yes, I actually did this. This, I, this issue was brought to my attention. I signed documents to that effect. For me, that would have been enough. But for you to go ahead and say that you think that it would be unconscionable on the part of government if its own poor record keeping is used to defeat legitimate claims of its creditors. Even if the documents are available, assuming the documents were available, the documents that the Minister of Justice and Finance couldn't get, even if they were available, that in itself is no conclusion that the claims that the people were making were legitimate. I think that it is about time we started looking at this issue as a national issue. You see, I can understand the MPP. The desperation is that, look, they have no issue to criticize this NDC. The only thing they clinged on was OMI. Now, other issues came up, and then they think that, no, we never said that judgment debt payment is wrong because there are now evidences proving that they themselves have sanctioned judgment debt. They themselves refused to go to court on the basis of claims that people were making. Now they try to shift the goalposts. It is also very important about the letter that was written by, by the then Minister of, of Justice, Joe Gatti. I listened to him. I listened to him and he said that when he wrote the letter, I guess on joy, when he wrote the letter, that later there were some information that were not made available to him. And that later he was informed by the chief, uh, the, the, the chief of staff. Why? Minister of Justice, I am not a lawyer, I'm not even a law student. Minister of Justice, the legal advisor of government, on what basis will you write a letter if you do not go through all the necessary documentation and you'll be convinced that, look, this particular letter I'm writing, I am convinced that what we are doing is something that will land this government into a particular position that will be uncomfortable. You wrote such a letter only for you to be informed by the chief of staff that, look, there are some information that were not made available. I think that it's an attempt to throw dust into the eyes of the people of this country. And I think we should move away from that. Question. I am happy. I am happy, Kojo, that they are now realizing that they cannot gain political capital, make a political capital out of this. I am happy that they are now realizing that we need to look at this as Ghanaians and consider it as a challenge that this nation is confronted with. I am very happy. Which is what brings me to my next question. Yeah. 
So, and I'm operating on this assumption. Yeah. Assuming you have succeeded in showing that Nanado was hypocritical on the subject of um, judgment debts and settlement payments and Jogati didn't do a good job. What happened to your mandate as government to govern and to solve the problems that confront the people of Ghana? One of them being this, this whole quagmire of payments that people think sometimes are fraught with corruption. And how are you, because you see the challenge out there is that people see you as seemingly trying to score political points with it when the substantive reason for which you, government, you are there to help lead, show the way in fixing this, you don't seem to be attacking with that much aggression. Could you first and foremost, I think that there is one conclusion that we've all come to, whether NDC or NMPP, that at any point in time, legitimate claims of people ought to be paid. That is one conclusion that we have all come to. Now, it's not about what people think about payments that have been made by government. It's about whether indeed those payments were made legitimately. I think that for me that is very important. Now, if indeed those payments were made legitimately, I don't think that we should be worried. It is also the responsibility of government to properly inform the people of this country with regards to decisions that are taken. And I think that precisely all these letters that are, be made, that, that are made public is one way of letting people understand. After all, we didn't even do anything wrong. What we did was in line with the laws of this nation. However, the opposition tried to create the impression that, look, we did something sacrilegious, we did something wrong. It is the responsibility of government to let those people understand. Another very important point, Kojo, we are not living in an island. We live governed by not only our laws, but international laws and international transactions. Now, the actions and inactions of any government with regards to either international companies has a profound bearing on our relations, our relations with other nations globally. Are we living in a nation that we want to be isolated because we think that we don't even treat, treat international companies fair? We think that we would honor people, people would do work for us, and then at the end of the day, we say we won't pay. Those days of we won't pay. I think that those days are gone. And that is, for me, what is supposed to be made very clearly. Again, <coughs> the media also has a responsibility. The media has a responsibility to be fair in their reportage. That is very significant. Everybody, they try to assert NDC, they even came out with a song. You know, and again, they left even women. They talked about CP. They talked about every single thing. Today, they are telling us that we shouldn't confuse default payment with judgment, this and others. But when they sit on TV and on radio and trying to do politics with this, they don't give this explanation. They don't give this distinction. And as long as we continue doing our politics that way, we'll forever have these challenges. Simple and short, the purpose for the press conference was not to say that this person did wrong or this person didn't do wrong. The purpose for the press conference was to expose the hypocrisy and let people understand that the very people who are saying that they won't pay. And the fact that Nana Kufaudu never said, I will not pay judgment debt. Yet his communicators, members, leading members in the MPP have made those statements. Are you telling me that those statements were not the true representation of the aspirations of the MPP? If Nana Kufaudu is aware that this, were not my posi this wasn't my position, he could have condemned them. They were happy. And most of these statements were made, like the one Dr. Mahmoud said when he, he did his uh, presented his economy. He said that clearly payment of judgment that, that is corruption. And that is one thing the man on the street believes in. That if you pay judgment that is corruption, as to whether it is legitimate, it is not legitimate, as long as you pay it, it's corruption. And Nanasafu, I think that that is one point. Nana Safo sent us a text. Says, the press conference held by Mr. Blackwell was trivial and unnecessary. He did that to undermine Anado's integrity. We don't use such propaganda to govern a country. God save us. Bruce from Takradi says, we were asked to brace up ourselves for a shocking revelation, only to be told Akufuado <laughs> had done nothing wrong. Amazing <laughs> convictions. Kobe says, why is the NDC still saying that Akufuado said he wasn't going to pay judgment debt? His exact words were that, Woyome won't happen under an Akufuado government. What you guys did on Monday is an apology of an attempt to do political equalization. But Ghanaians are wide awake and your attempt has badly backfired. Zakaria from Tamale says, the NDC, after paying their gargantuan debt, now want to smear Akufuado, but they will fail because Ghanaians are the wiser. Mohammed from Yendi says, tell Nobla Blackwa to do Ghanaians a favor by publishing the letter Dr. Tano wrote to Nanado if he really wants transparency. Ibn Faraz says Kujon Pini and Nanado should be made to pay yeah. for the judgment <laughs> that, that they cost. <laughs> Kujon, let me hear you. Kujon Pini certainly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, was it Monday, last Monday's press conference? Yeah. Uh, they succeeded in scoring an own goal. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> and it is God knows these days. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the government did. They scored an own goal. And I'll proceed to analyze it. Uh, last week, we indicated here that there is a certain characteristic, you know, that is worrying based, I mean, uh, relative to this serialization. Because these are their own words, anyway, that they are serialized. Now, I think. I'm told you sunshine or something. Sunlight's coming. Sunlight's coming. Sunlight's coming. Sunlight's coming. Another one. <laughs> another one is coming pretty soon. <laughs> You've taken over from Sunday. <laughs> oh no, no, he, he will still be ahead. Well, another one, one is coming. Another, <laughs> no, in terms of one. dropping hints ahead of time. Yes. Oh yeah, there's another very interesting one that will come up soon. Could you? I'm sure you follow. In the case of the AAL, that selectivity was clear. Where attached as letter and to some extent, the investigative report of the insight. In this case, it wasn't the insight itself, or Kusi Prad will put it out. The two were put out there. Minus, by reduce answers to the urgent question in Parliament, November 8, 2001. Minus the BNI report. Minus the SFO report. Minus the Auditor General's report. When people made noises here and there, then a letter, an offer, and a letter of acceptance were brought forward. Those who were trying to throw light on an issue were selective in what they presented to the public for us to begin an in, uh, investigation of an issue or a discussion. Come to Isofoton. I hope I've pronounced it right. Yeah. The same thing happened. A certain letter by a Spanish official and another one were put out there, Joe Gatti's June 4th, 2008 letter, were put out there for us to discuss. Meanwhile, they were aware that there were other letters, other court processes, like the fact that Joe Gatti filed a defense, there was an affidavit in support, there was an application to set aside default judgment. The government was privy to all these things. They chose not to advertise those until others brought it on board so that the discussion became broader. Meanwhile, the basic theme behind this realization is transparency and full disclosure. That's what they tell us. Come Great Cape, what do we have? We have two letters, both signed by Nana Kufuado. 18th April 2001, as when he was in office as an attorney general, and 3rd October 2011, I'm sure it's the right date, yeah. when he was no longer an attorney general, but a flag bearer for the main opposition party. Significantly, we are not told of the existence of this letter, dated 20th September 2011, emanating from the office of Dr. Nat Tano. The letter that was seeking said letter, real, letter and signature authentication, appeal for assistance. Fairness, in the name of transparency and full disclosure, wouldn't it have been fair for this particular letter to have been disclosed as well, to give both the media and the public the basis for an objective analysis? So, you see, when a government declares publicly that it has a policy of transparency and full disclosure relative to these matters, judgment, there's compensation, settlement claims, all those things. And this government persistently, consistently suffers a certain deficit <laughs> relative to disclosure of documentation that would enable all of us to have a very dispassionate and fair discussion. I question their integrity on this matter. Wow. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mm. It means that there's no attempt to promote equity, transparency, justice, or fairness. It's so obvious. So your motive becomes questionable. You may not think so. For all you know, maybe you think you are doing well. If, if, it, if it's genuine, then it's inept. That ineptitude is amazing and ought not to be happening to a government 
<laughs> communication machinery led by the Ministry of Information. We deserve better, in my candid opinion. Is there anything significant in that letter, by the way, Kweku? Well, absolutely not. Indeed, before you go, why not? The, the opening paragraph of Akufuado's letter has why not? that he was responding to a letter. In exactly. Exactly. This letter was written to Akufuado, not copied to the ministries of finance or attorney general. So, how was government supposed to have had it? Absolutely. It, it doesn't add anything to the debate that we are having. Please, please. <laughs> this letter is copied, it's copied. to <laughs> Honorable Dr. Kwabna Dufour, <laughs> Minister <laughs> of Finance. No, no, but Ministry. No, please, please. Okay. I, I kept okay, right, 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 I was right, talking. Right, right, right. This letter. Is copied <laughs> to Dr. Kobna Dufour, yeah. and the gentleman, after making a, a recapping, I mean, re, re, recounting all those earlier things between him and Ubeda Samoa and Kwame Pepper and all the rest, now comes to make the point that they are being told to get that <coughs> letter, the April 18, 2011 letter authenticated, validated. Mm. So he makes this point. In this regard, Honorable Sir, the minister made it abundantly clear that he would also be happy to act if you were in receipt of an affidavit, affidavit or letter from your good self, simply stating that you are indeed the author and signatory of the attached letter, recommending the supplementary payment to Great Cape through the often mentioned letter, though the often mentioned letter is not on a headed paper. You would also notice, Honorable Sir, that the copy I have attached is an original copy on which the ink from the pen used for your signature is indeed vis clearly visible. Sir, I'm appealing to you to kindly use your good offices to assist us in the authentication of this crucial letter. I believe that such verification would indeed be in furtherance of our bid to resolve this long overdue matter that has unbelievably and unjustifiably spanned three decades and counting. This you can do, sir, by simply writing to indicate that you can categorically confirm that the signature on the attached letter is indeed yours and that you are convinced that the letter is authentic. I would also be most grateful, sir, if you would also design, if you, you would also design, uh, there's Get something wrong. Glasses. In, no, 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 <laughs> the word, I don't know, D-E-I-G-N, Dean, mm. in your reply to copy the Honorable Minister of Finance as well. I thank you, sir, in anticipation of your kindly, humane, just, and speedy attention to this most pressing and long overdue letter. When Anal Kufuadu wrote his letter, he copied, as instructed, uh, directed, the Minister of Finance and indeed the Minister of Justice and Attorney, Attorney, Attorney General. General. Uh -huh. He brought sunlight. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Could you, uh, he was not hiding. He was not writing a letter. Nicodemus. Oh, Nicodemus. First and foremost, first and foremost, NDC, we made it very clear. And myself and Felix, we've all said here that the purpose for the press conference we held was to expose the hypocrisy of the NPP, and particularly their flag bearer. So your question is? I'm coming, I'm coming. So if Nana wrote, Nana Kufado wrote a letter, or the, the company wrote a letter to Nana Kufado, it is not in our interest to talk about that letter. And in any case, the letter that Nana Kufado, please, it is not in our interest to talk about that letter. Wow. The letter Nana Kufado himself wrote clearly indicates that he was responding to a letter that was written to him. So, so you expected, is, I'm asking is, to, 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 does Kweku expect the NDC to say that, okay, the company wrote a letter to Nana Akufado, demanding that he authenticates as to whether indeed their claims and other things they made were actually, because the documents are not available. And then Nana also wrote a letter. It wouldn't make any sense to us if we really want to achieve the purpose for which the press conference we have. So your question is, does Kweku expect government yes. communication? Exactly, to, to talk about that. It's not necessary. It doesn't add anything. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't okay. in any way undermine the effort that we make. Exactly. This, 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 this is a government that we, the citizens of the, this <laughs> land, have given a mandate to, to rule in the name of the Constitution. Mm -hmm. And fortunately for us, this government, in carrying out this exercise, mm -hmm. indicated that it was driven by full disclosure. Absolutely. The principles of full disclosure. Mm -hmm. They didn't tell us that, oh, this is a press conference to expose hypocrisy, even if that was beneath the scene. 
the most important thing is that you declared publicly that your aim was full disclosure. And I'm saying that you are telling us today that because you displayed this letter, and the first paragraph said this is to acknowledge receipt of your letter, uh, letter of 20th September, requesting my assistance in the statement of government's long-standing indebtedness to Great Cape Company of Switzerland, it was sufficient. That's unfair to us. Why? Indeed, the, mere, the fact that there's an indication of a receipt of a letter would require that you, produ you produce this letter. This is not a 100-page letter. So that people cannot carry around. Now, what will so you question no. their integrity and their motive? Because um, they're yeah, not actually doing their own the full declared, declared disclosure. policy of full okay. disclosure. Okay. That's fine. And transparency. No, that nobody asks them. them. No, 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 whether it has <laughs> anything or not, what is disclosure? Oh, you say fool. <laughs> you didn't tell us selective disclosure. Say, please. Now we must as well talk about the very day the letter was written. Listen, Now it's beginning to degenerate into heckling. He's made his point. Let him proceed. I'll come around the table to have you. Uh, make your point, Kwebu. Yes, we hold them to their own declared principles. <laughs> and on that score, they failed. And that <laughs> is clear. Now, having failed so abysmally <laughs> in, in, in meeting the principles they are set for themselves, they are now telling us that, oh, it was to expose hypocrisy. Let's examine that as well. Mm -hmm. See, first of all, here on this very table, and two, three, four days ago, at least, on PCFM's uh, Kukuru Kuru program. This point was canvassed by Deputy Information Minister uh, Ajini Mbwati, that Baumia had said that payment of judgment debt was synonymous with corruption. He quoted a headline and said it could be found on the website of Daily uh, uh, PCFM. Kodu, it was produced. That thing was produced. And apart from the headline, which apparently was the uh, headline crafted by Daily Guy, because Daily Guy was a primary source of that story that the PCFM uh, website had picked. Kwame Sefakai read through the story to the hearing of Ajini Mwati and the rest of us, and for that matter, the whole wide world. And nowhere. But he has reported it. Yes, that's the point I'm making, that I am surprised. You see? What our own distortions. Yes. <laughs> and they are inviting us to join them in celebrating that distortion. Some of us declined that invitation. Yes, I tell it, you? We decline to celebrate it, but we, we, we decide to expose it. This is exactly, so they have no basis. Bahumia has not made that statement. Now, Akufuado too, we've been told that he says he will never pay judgment debts. Where? What I heard Akufuado say was that Woyeme will not happen under him. And we all know what Woyeme had become associated with. Because these days you are advising us not to talk plenty about it. I, I do not like uh, want to go in there. But, my brother, what was it about? Situations where a letter of introduction by a minister of state was canvassed as being a contract on this very station and this very program by a deputy chief of staff. A situation where a sitting attorney general took a concurrent approval delivered by Central Tender Review Board as amounting to a binding agreement. That too was canvassed very, on this very table. Those things were the basis on which somebody, and don't forget, the lawyer of Waterville, Mr. Kwame Tete, had written black in black and white to the state, to government, saying that this man had no contract with you and that he had contract with us, we had finished with him, we had finished paying him. This characteristics of the way you make matter is what brought the controversy. What have you? It's the same thing. Their contract had been illegally abrogated because it didn't, indeed it did not become effective since they did not fulfill conditions precedent. They agreed. And they agreed. They wrote a letter. I brought them here. They come back after a, a change in government and negotiate with the government on abrogation of contract and are paid. These are the issues. See, now you realize Osafu Mafu is in court as a state witness. Mm -hmm. Obi Amo will be there. Ajman Yenu will be there. Does it tell you a story? That assuming... This gentleman who were alive and kicking had been consulted earlier when people were making their petitions. 
and claims. Would we have arrived at a situation where we would have gone to court and filed a consent judgment based on fraud and a mistake? As we ourselves, the state, are today suggesting? These are serious issues. So it's particular judgment debts that brought about the controversy and all this noise in the public domain. I see, this is August when? 27th, 2009, Hansard. Supplementary uh, report on the supplementary estimates for the year 2009 financial year. You remember the finance minister had indicated earlier that most of the judgment debts had arisen out of bad governance on the part of the NPP. And Joe Gatti decided to make a response on the floor of the House. Subsequently, they also held a press conference. There is a clear admission here in this official record of parliament that the NPP paid judgment debts even pull some cases out of court, like Alaji Yusuf. This is what uh, uh, Jogati said. Mr. Speaker, Alaji Yusuf's hotel was broken down at the airport and was asking for $10 million. We negotiated and brought the thing down to less than 50%. This is MPP speaking publicly on the floor of the house. To less than 50%? Yes. They paid over $6 million, so it couldn't be less than 50%. I am saying this is what I'm reading here. So he was not being honest. You don't even know what you are talking about. Oh, the gentleman no. was asking for $12 million dollars in court. Point. You read $10 million. Let I am saying... Point and I'll come right. I have so the don't court documentation. I, I don't, I don't see so why. I ask him why so. This okay. here, and there are many other examples he gave. This is a, a, a public record. Apart from that, go back to 2006. 2nd June, Hansard. Public Accounts Committee report. On uh, judgment debts, the chairman was Salas Minza, who was reading. There was this judgment that De Delta Foods Company, which began 1997. And the Accra court ruled against the state. We didn't pay. It went to the US. So when the MPP came, in fact, the MD NDC government number two paid 4.9 in March 2000. The oh, MPP, so no, 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 I'm coming. So, and then MPP, then uh, April 2002 was in office as attorney general. The advised payment and money, the money was paid 4.9 to Delta Foods on public record. And there's nothing more public and authoritative than the Hansard. So the, there's no debate as to whether MPP had ever paid judgment debts or not. It doesn't arise. It's a distortion created by some people who need it in order to defend a very bad case. And that's exactly what is going on. And I think Ghanaians are more discerning than people think. And this must be rejected outright. So to be honest with you, as I said, last Monday's press conference, our friends in the government scored an own goal. I've been asking a question around the table that there's also another substantive question that this whole thing needs to be tidied up. Do you think that in all that government has done so far, Felix has been explaining that there are a number of things going on in the background, but do you think, uh, you know, Ghanaians who are consuming all of this information get the material, I mean, get the, get, the, get the message that the substantive issues are also being worked on, there are court cases ongoing, do you think that message is coming across? Uh, there's some amount of confusion in the exercise, deliberately being engineered by people in government to distort the environment, pollute the environment. They think it's help, it helps them. You see, this is where people were caught on the wrong foot, based on Wyoming, Waterville, Rock Shell, and others. And in order to equalize, desperate equalization, equalization they are confusing issues. It's not helping. One would have said, in principle, wanting to throw light or bring sunshine was good. It, after all, it, it complements. But in so doing, you are being selective. So, your, your motive, I don't believe they are interested in, in, in that. To be honest with you, I don't believe they are doing what they are doing with an eye on the campaign. Sunshine campaign. It's <laughs> not like the election campaign. That's what it is. Yeah, Let's campaign. be honest. And for those who are looking for a resolution of all of these judgment debt settlement payment matters, do you get the impression that they are consuming all of these press conferences and all of these uh, comments with a conviction that, ah, finally, we are getting somewhere with this. No, I don't believe so. But because we come here to do post-mortem, 
come to do critical interrogation. We are actually those who are bringing sun, sun, sunshine. Sunshine. Out of the darkness. <laughs> nice. So he wanted to react. This yeah, is part I, I, I think that. Okay. Why okay. not? Let me just okay. let him react and then right. come to you and then okay. go to okay. react. Well, first and foremost, I think that what, what Kweku read here is about what happened in Parliament. And he indicated, he read it, I didn't read it, that 10 million and they paid less than 50%. I'm saying that they paid over 6 million. So it couldn't be that. So is it that it, is it a topographical error? They didn't pay. They paid. They paid. Yeah, they they paid. This government yeah. paid. This government paid. No, it was paid. Yes, I'm coming. It wasn't people. It, it was paid. Hold on, people. hold on. It was, yeah. it was paid on the 7th of January. No, no, it wasn't paid. Hold on, hold on, hold on. 7th of January 2009. It wasn't paid. Yeah. On it was paid on the 7th of January 2009, the very day His Excellency the President was being sworn in. <laughs> well, our word. It's about your word and my word. No. You tell me. You know, the transition please. team froze. <laughs> please hold on. I'm saying that it was paid on the 7th of January 2009. <laughs> That's right. From this document. Yes. <laughs> Which document is this? The, the judgment does they paid. In fact, some were even paid. I'll tell you. Another one, Mr. E.K. Usu, who was paid three million, was paid you know on the same day. You know who it, is. It's not about who that person is. Yeah, but you've mentioned oh, the go, name. Go, 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 go. It's not about who, who that person is. You know it's about the person. And that was not paid on Hold that on, day. Hold on, please. It was yeah, paid on that the, day. The, the okay, so why? 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 You so would, okay, okay. 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 So, 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 so the point is, is, the point, the, the is, point is, is that it means that some untruth was 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 told to Palo. Where? Please. I'm okay. saying that some untruth was told to Palo. That if Jugati said it was negotiated down to less than 50%. Yes. And your document suggests that if you could read it again. But again, you see, The whole issue of the letter Nana Akufado wrote, I think that both, both Nana and Kweku are run away from the fact. The fact is that it's not about authentication. It's about what he indicated in that letter. That it was unconscionable, unconscionable. not to pay legitimate Made claims. claims. How would he determine that <laughs> the claims they were making were legitimate? And I'm saying, oh, that, ah. please, 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 I'm no, saying. No, 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 relax, oh, please, gentlemen, oh, relax. Please. We've got to run the, right. absence, the, absence, the absence of the documents. The, the 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 absence of the documents with either the minister of finance or the minister of justice in itself like i said here was not a justification that government couldn't afford the case in court and so How we had no basis exactly. to say they were exactly no no you wanted to react and then i'll go yeah. to felix well yeah i mean first of all um let me just say that i i want this is just a general point about about the rules governing matters in court i think i've heard so many people especially from the government side try to use it to not have people talk about some of these matters. The rules are very clear. The facts of the matter, that the matters that are in court, we're able to talk about. It is when we attempt to prejudge the matter. So if a Kufuado goes to Woyomer's village and asks them whether he, they benefited from Woyomer's money, there is nothing contemptuous about it because it is a fact that Woyomer got money. It is a fact. It is in public records in court. Remember, courts are not secret societies. They're public places. All we want to do is to avoid people placing the court in an untenable position where we seem to prejudge the matter and thereby scandalize the court. That is not what it is. Secondly, Baumia has never said anywhere that the payment of judgment debts per se is corrupt. And Mutala should tell us exactly where Baumia said that and quote to us what he said, because that is not what Baumia said. If you can't substantiate it, I think you should withdraw it. Can I say it? You've asked yeah, me a question. Yes, it's say it. no, it's important. Now, now it's important. That, that's it's important. That's important. That's important. Hold on, hold on. That's, that, that, that's, that's, that's the point I even don't have much Please. time. Kweku said that we said PCFM online, and that PCFM got the information from Daily Guide. That was what yeah, yeah, said. Uh, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Today, Daily Guide is discredited. Oh! Please hold on. I'm coming. PCFM got it on Daily Guide. Now, if the minister sat here and said that it is on PCFM online, and PCFM got it on Daily Guide, Now, you are not asking me to prove. You should be asking Daily Guy. You, you no, said no, it. No, no, no. no, you should be asking no, 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 Daily Guy. No, no, no. no, no, no. Okay. Daily Guy. Okay. I'm saying Daily that we, have, we told you our listen. source. I Let me you. tell I'm you. I'm saying that we told you. you. We, we, don't have, we, we don't have time. We don't have time. Listen, listen, listen. Mutala, I moderate this program. Take your time. Can I? You are reading something from Baumier's statement for me, right? I'm saying that the deputy minister The deputy minister said, Kweku said he said on this platform something. You said you were going to read it. I'm saying that Kweku said have it for Please, I'm coming. Kweku said that the deputy minister said it on peace. That's not what. Hold on. That's what Kweku said. That the deputy minister said it on That the deputy minister said it on peace. Yes. And the deputy minister said that it was on peace FM online. Now, Kweku is telling us that what is on PCFM online was gotten from Daily Guide. Are you getting the point? Now, if I sit down and I say, like the Deputy Minister said, not I am saying, the Deputy Minister said that I've got this information on my journal online, and then you tell me that the information you got is wrong, 
And now you are now asking me to prove it. You should be asking Joy how they got right. the information. This is what okay. this is okay. what this is so, what so, Dr. Yeah. Baumia said. Question, question. Um are you able to read a quote for me of what Dr. Baumia said? You said you were gonna read it for oh, me. Oh the heading is that's that 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 CD 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 uh, CD free fall as a headline to the story. I'm it looking doesn't for a quote to please, the story. Please, I'm coming. Judgment debt is corruption. Baumia <laughs> attributed to Baumia by PCFM online, who they got from <laughs> Daily Guy. I think everybody watching and listening can okay. understand. This, yeah, is what, this, this was what <laughs> Mr. Baum, Dr. <laughs> Baumia said. He said, and I quote, <laughs> the overpricing of supplies, <laughs> contracts, <laughs> supplies <laughs> contracts in areas such as health, education, <laughs> infrastructure, etc., as well as judgment debt paid for work not done, she, is a major area it. of concern. That's it. That is what Dr. Baumia said. He never said it. anywhere that anybody uh, that uh, was. Now, let me just put it also. He says that uh, like, uh, they keep focusing again on Ekufuado's letter where he says that it would be unconscionable if the state were to deny paying legitimate, legitimate claims. claims. Now, that, for example, if you're being very fair and honest, it doesn't necessarily even apply to the gatekeep company. Remember that he, the preceding sentences had to do with poor record keeping. Secondly, Ekufuado has already determined that. It was a legitimate claim. And when you juxtapose that with Waterville, hmm, where they themselves conceded that the breach of uh, the, the abrogation of contract was proper, came back, collected 25 million euro. If you look at Rockshell, where they had agreed to compensation of 12 million, 7 million had been paid. We're looking at a balance of five, and yet they paid an additional 35 million. If you look at the AAL case that I mentioned earlier, where they did not even have a con contract, and the government was trying to get them a judgment of 14 million. If you juxtapose that to truly legitimate claims, okay. you see the point that Akufu was okay. making. Let me go to Felix to wrap up. And uh, while hey. that, you were mentioning yeah. that there were you know, some future revelations yeah. that are also coming. Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's one that, that, that involves high-ranking members of the NPP who today are mounting the more high ground no, and, Felix, wait. and seeking oh, to... Wait, 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 wait. All right. Just one last point. I think Mutala also mentioned that the Great Cape Company was <laughs> as a result of a judgment. Yeah, yeah. I think it should be made no, clear no, 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 that there, no, no, there was no, no, absolutely no, 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 no judgment. I, I, never, okay. I said that. Felix, I was making that statement in relation to all other issues. And you said that we shouldn't confuse default payments with judgment. No, no, no. Let me go well, fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 there's there's, 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 there's another one that, 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 that is pretty interesting involving high ranking persons who today are mounted the more high ranking. Who are those people? Well, I think that when the press conference takes place, when the disclosure takes place, but you see, I find it difficult <laughs> to, to appreciate Nana's <laughs> point that persons who spoke on behalf of the MPP yes. and in effect Nana Akufuado exactly. cannot be saying things that represent the views of Nana Akufuado. You see, I, from the top of my head, can mention three MPP spokespersons whom I have encountered on programs who have said that the payment of judgment debt was wrong and that it is a misplaced priority. They have said that Nanadu was going to use the payment of judgment debt or money that would have been used to pay judgment debt to finance his free SHS. There is a tip that I have acquired because I wanted to be certain that indeed the person said that, even though I encountered him on the program and I remember it. I have confirmed that Abu Dinapo stated mm -hmm. that Nanaru was going to finance his free SHS yes, by yes. applying money that would be used to finance that mandate. Abu Dinapo is described yeah. as an aid to Nanaru. He is an aid yeah, what to Nanaru. I don't yeah. No, so you cannot distance yourselves from the point you are making that MP people have indeed said. That judgment yeah. that payment. So everything you've said, corruption. you can attribute it to Mr. No, but no, 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 no. What is, what is my dismissal? Relax. Abu Dinapo is an aid to Nanaru. And you are a government Nanaru communication person. Nanaru went to, and let's Nanaru went to, to, his to, to speak about his free SHS. <laughs> he was called to shed light on what yes. Nanaru said. He yeah. was questioned by the interviewer. Uh -huh. How is Nanaru going to fund it? Then he yeah. says, why? We've paid judgment debt of 642 million. Yes. We'll use that to pay free SHS. But that in yeah. itself doesn't yeah. mean that's that's it. legitimate. No, but if you say, listen, listen. No, no, but oh, if you say, corruption. No, 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 no. But when you say, was when, you say let it, no, no, please. when you say judgment debt of 642 million, it includes payments made to people who had legitimate claims. That there was a problem with one. No one. Hey, oh, please, 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 please. He got to who are sat relax. on this program please, please. and said that the CP judgment stinks. It has yeah. proven to be false. Yeah. Oh, that's not true. Yeah. Oh, oh, you said, oh, you are quoted on my God. It still like, stinks. It still stinks. It does not. Yeah. Yeah. You failed to prove it. It is not. 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 It is uh, the minority yeah. leader, Andrea FM again, said that that payment was fraudulent. Yeah. Isaac Esiama still goes around saying it is fraudulent. So they cannot run away from their own statements yeah. because they've been caught pants down. Wrap it again, up for me. Wrap he it up says for me. that he seeks to assail the integrity of the process that we are engaging and says that we, we concealed some information <coughs> from the people of Ghana, which then meant that the MPP or the persons that 
have been mentioned in these matters had legitimate cases that were not factored into. All the letters that Koku refers to have no material bearing on the on points this. that we've made. Nanado's letter, the very first paragraph makes it clear that he was responding to a letter. Indeed, during the press conference, the, the deputy minister made it a point to explain the background to this matter. The African Automobile <coughs> Limited matter. Who, who showed a lack of integrity in that discourse? Was it not MPP people who came denying that there was a contract? Barry will do this letter no that he speaks there about. Is. Show that there was a contract. There's no conclusion. There is. And then the Isopoto <laughs> matter. He says that Jogate <laughs> filed no a contract. defense. Last week, I challenged you to contract. read what the defense of Jogate was. You will see that it is a defense that will not master scrutiny. Well, you are not a judge. So I am so, 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 If you say that public, let's say that public. I will say that If you say that public, let's say that public. In conclusion, in conclusion, we have demonstrated that whilst the MPP was singing a different team before mm. this. They were paying they that, they they that they, they were condemning they were the government of that They made it seem <laughs> like the NDC government was irresponsible, doling out money to cronies. True. When they were writing behind the scenes it, to employ okay. to pay their <laughs> point it's 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 six, We are six minutes. We are six minutes. I have to take a break at this time. We are 16 minutes to 11. You've been very disruptive in this session. I would encourage you to let each other speak. I would encourage you to let each other speak so that you can make your point without interruption. Daniel Asante from Teaching and says the MPP's hypocrisy has now been exposed. They are running away from their own shadows. Oh they must God. stop this hypocrisy. Thomas from the UDS says a black one must be joking. What he did on Monday only amounts to political immaturity and mischief. It only gives credence to the view that the Ministry of Information is just a propaganda tool for government and should be scrapped off. A G. Clark says, in my candid opinion, all political and civic institutions should come together to create a better system to help government functionaries determine how and when uh, contracts should and should not be cancelled. That should be the core issue we must be discussing now. What is gone is gone. Sule from Tamale says, The problem is not with the payment of judgment debts. It's rather the way government officials turn themselves into spokespersons for some of these like, like, companies. Like, like, Mike <laughs> from Navrongo <laughs> says, How can monies supposed to be used for development be used on judgment debts? Those who are responsible should be punished. John Sarkodie Ado uh, in Germany says, I think the letter written by Akufo Ado was intended to authenticate or disregard a claim by an institution in the country. He just authenticated his signature and rightly admonished the institution involved not to allow the elapses to injure the rights Absolutely. of Ado. Could have just Augustine Amponsa um, says, the NDC should leave <laughs> Nanado alone and concentrate on how they are going to hand over power to the MPP. Uh, next year. Michael Manfi mm -hmm. Akwapim says the MPP has never mm -hmm. said judgment debt in itself is bad. He rather attempted to distinguish between illegitimate and legitimate judgment debt. The MPP's <laughs> position is to make judgment <laughs> debt payments <laughs> not yeah, abused. Titus from yes. Tepa what says three years oh. against eight years. I think the great party, the NDC, stands taller than the MPP. It's clear that the NDC will win the 2012 elections. Etuya Hini Berima from Mampon says, is this the quote, blow our minds press conference? The NDC government should be serious with us. We pay taxes to the government and they should be serious with us. Silas Amo from Kenya as he says, Mr. Blackwell's press conference was just to divert attention on the revelations that have come out concerning the NDC and the huge sums of money that they paid under the cap of judgment debts. The press conference did not blow the minds of Ghanaians. It was cheap propaganda. We're going to go for a little break. When we return, Nana Akumia would replace... Um, Nana Santi video to us. We continue with some of our conversations. It was an interesting week in Parliament. A couple of things that I want my guests to comment on uh, about things in Parliament. First, uh, the constitutional instrument, CI 73, that is supposed to bring into being the 45 new constituencies that are being created, was laid before Parliament, or was it not? A bit of a brouhaha over it. Eventually, it was laid. Uh, Parliament is still trying to figure out how to get it to count for 21 sitting days. It appears that members of parliament may have to be recalled during their next break so that they can, you know, sit for those 21 days to be counted by which time it becomes law. Therefore, it would then be applicable for the December polls and the authorities will have good <coughs> time uh, to be able to apply it. But it came with its own back and forth. Uh, the argument is that the real deal here is that the minority is opposing it because they hold the view that the majority may stand to gain from these 45 new constituencies. The demarcations are such that they may stand to gain. Uh, the other charge is that the majority are trying to push it through because they think they will gain. I'll hear what my guests think of that. And still in Parliament, the Minister of Parliament, the Minister, I beg your pardon, of Finance, was asking for $2.61 uh, you know, for the supplementary budget. We're told that the documents have been withdrawn because some of the calculations may be wrong. It could go up a little beyond the 2.61. But the bigger question is, 
can rigorous forecasting remove the need for supplementary budgets in the future? I want to take the thoughts of our various guests who are here uh, with us this morning on News Farm. Mutala, let me start with you on the development in Parliament. These two, as I have mentioned. The, the, the creation of the new consensus and, and uh, also the supplementary uh, Political budget. arguments being made of them and the supplementary budget. I think that I'll just take the supplementary budget first. I think the, the information we got initially was that there was even some quoted. I listened to Joy once again. I think that Joy should be giving me some, some award for listening to you and keeping faith with Joy. Yesterday, that an addition of, was it 50,000 or 500,000, something, a, a figure was quoted. <coughs> And the, the spokesperson, or the one in charge of communication at the Minister of Finance, uh, said, denied that and indicated that there was some problem with topographical pro problem with regards to original uh, document that was presented by the, by the Minister of Finance. He talked about original doc the document presented by the Minister. He talked also about the one that was given to members of Parliament and also the, is it the bulletin or the PowerPoint form, which was about three pages. And I think that that issue was, was clarified. This is not unusual that at any point in time, supplementary budgets can't be presented. Again, uh, the concern that some people, particularly brothers and sisters in the opposition race, had to do with, fact, with the fact that we are left with some few months, and therefore, if you are bringing it, some even went ahead to say that it is just for the purposes of the elections and others. I think that the business of government would continue, whether we have elections or we are left with a day or two. Uh, you know, a, a business of government will continue. And I guess that is the light in which this budget was presented. And the Minister of Finance indicated <coughs> that it also had to do with some funding or support that would be given to, to the Electoral Commission, you know, security-wise and others. We would need to support them. I think it's, it's necessary. Government also talked about the fact that the, the wage bill has actually increased because over 90 percent of, of public sector workers are now offloaded into the single spine. I mean, something which was a little over 200, uh, uh, 2 billion has now catapulted to almost six or over six, 6 billion. And I think that that has occasioned and is necessary. But I would want to look at the, the creation of the, the, the consensus. Uh, the argument has always been, or the argument has been with, with, with standing orders of, of the House as to whether in laying the, the bill you need to also indeed give members of parliament copies. I'm not a lawyer, but I guess that the, 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 the courts of parliament, both minority and majority, has been that standing on the 75-1. I think that, that that was what the minority was quoting, that you needed to have provided members of parliament with copies. Uh, and then the majority also argument, and the ruling, um, if you like, or the, the conclusion that they all came to had to do with the fact that standing on the 77 states that even after you laid, you should have gazetted it and then give members of parliament the copy. What is important in all this debate has to do with one statement I guess the minority leader made on, on Joy once again, that he and the majority leader and the speaker uh, have sat and then they are trying to find out how they can come out with, with amicable solution. But he made one striking point that, that if it is revealed that there is some political agenda or to, to, to score some political goals, then people may raise concerns. I think let's get something very clear. The MPP did that in 2004. It never helped the MPP. Because if you look at the number of consensus that were created, I guess they didn't win all the consensus that were created, even though they created some consensus. Some concerns were raised again in 2004 with regards to the creation of the consensus. There is that argument that has also been made that the NDC has forced the Electoral Commission to create more consensus because the Electoral Commission hinted that they were going to create 20 consensus. But because of the creation of the districts, they had to create about 45 consensus. The, exact, the government's decision to create consensus doesn't hinge on whether the Electoral Commission, uh, to create more districts, doesn't hinge on whether the Electoral Commission wants to create consensus or not. And let's get this, this distinction. If it so happens that the government has created a district, and um, for the purposes of the districts that have been created, and by law, that you can't have one particular MP, seven, two districts. The Electoral Commission is mandated to create more consensus. I think that people should. Again, the MPP have argued that the NDC has lost the elections already. The NDC, people are disillusioned, they are disenchanted, they are dissatisfied with the type of rulership, and therefore the NDC, the MPP would win the elections. If you are winning an elections, you are winning an elections, not in a particular area. You are winning an elections, the entire nation. 
Now, if the NPP knows that the NDC has lost elections already, why are they worried that the Electoral Commission is creating more consensus? Because they should even be happy that more consensus are being created and that they will win the elections and they will win more parliamentary seats. There's another point that I think that ought to be made and made forcefully. The creation of the consensus are not done by the NDC or the government. <coughs> they are done by the Electoral Commission. If you monitor the argument that is being made, particularly by MPP commentators, they heap the entire blame on, on government completely forgotten that it is the Electoral Commission that is fulfilling its, electoral, uh, its constitutional mandate. And let's look at it in that perspective. But do you know why all this argument? The NPP, even the surveys that they themselves have conducted, they have come to the realization that they can't win the elections. Now what they are trying to do is that, let's push the elections into a second round. And pushing it into a second round, we should have won more parliamentary seats. And if we win more parliamentary seats, then what happened in 2008 would happen. So that you win more parliamentary seats, even if Nana gets 40% or below 40%, we'll go in for a second round, and then we'll use it as an advantage. Psychologically, it makes people understand that we would not want to have crisis. And therefore, if the NPP has won more parliamentary seats than the NDC, why not give them the mandate? And you think that's why they are stopping I'm, the process? I'm coming. No, no, yes, I would, I would explain why. Just like what happened in 2008. You know, in the first round, the NPP was leading, and the NDC won more parliamentary seats. I understand seats. that. And they are now thinking, they are doing yes, this. and they are thinking that with the creation of new consensus, it has <coughs> destabilized, dissipated all their plans. But one simple message. The elections is not even going into a second round. The NDC is winning the elections in the first round, one touch. There is no question at all about that. Because we are so convinced that it is not about what people say. It is about how the people feel on the ground. It is about the fact that schools have been built. It is about the fact that hospitals have been, have been provided. It is about the fact that farmers have been given fertilizers. They are no longer given fertilizers on coupon basis. It is about the fact that there are a lot of roads that have been constructed. These are the real issues. These are the issues that will determine whether they should renew the mandate. It is about the fact that they are dealing with a presidential candidate in the, in the person of His Excellency the President, who is humble, God-fearing. And they would want to be governed by such a person. Let me ask and you I think that that would take on the development in the parliament and how to ensure that in the near future we handle it better. Uh, see, 20 something years huh? in democratic uh, evolution or transition that this country is going through. We keep on saying we're doing very well. I share that view. I know we have challenges. But uh, couldn't we have done this with some finesse, less controversy? How many months to elections? Uh, we are some few months to elections. I'm told the campaign will start uh, August. Parliament, you've gone and placed this instrument before Parliament. I'm being told that it has to at least be there for 21 sitting days from the calculations, that is itself a challenge. So parliament may have to be recalled in all sorts of manner just in order to allow this to go through, after which uh, the parties will have to go out there, the new constituencies, do primaries, and uh, start perfecting their campaign strategies. Few months to elections. Why do we impose such uh, constraint and burden on ourselves? First, there are people who are asking 45 in addition to the 30, uh, the 230 the means 200 and something, uh, 270 something. Uh, where do we stop? When? How? There are countries with bigger populations, bigger land size, they don't have this normal. So we've got to look at all those things as we move, even though there may be legal basis for some of these things going on. So I am disturbed. And I remember the very first time this matter came up on this program. Some of us expressed the desire that it may not degenerate into political controversy in, in an election year very close to the election. It's, it, we don't need it. It's needless. So how come? How did we arrive at this stage? That maybe the census was not uh, released early. The districts <coughs> were created. New districts were created a bit too late. It's all part of that whole part of you know, uh, apparent disorganization. We deserve better as a nation in terms of quality of management. And I'm not looking at only government, central government. You see, it's across board. The institutions of states that are mandated legally to do certain things are all part of this mess. And here we are, five months to election. We are debating all these things. We are now going to create new constituencies, demarcate them here and there, uh, polling stations be cut across. We are going to, I mean, why? Why? What's wrong with us? You fear to give us problems we in we December? 
maybe we'll be able to manage. I'm a Ghanaian. I love, I want this country to remain peaceful. I want us to go through the elections, no matter who wins. Bottom line, this country should remain intact. We can't negotiate that away. Okay? But I also think that we could have done better. We could have dealt with things in a more organized way, more disciplined way. You know, cohesiveness, be. But all this confusion, it, it makes you sometimes wonder what's happening to this great nation. So for me, uh, that's my problem. I've been lamenting quietly, listening to everybody across the divide. Cases are in court, four cases or so are in court, and everything is proceeding as if there's nothing happening on that legal judicial landscape. What? This country is better place to do things in a better way. That's my whole thing. I'm so frustrated with this particular matter. Felix, I don't know if you share Nkweku's frustration, and perhaps if you can prof profess some views on uh, uh, how to tidy it up, especially as we head towards December, and maybe in the near future, ensure that we don't repeat this murky situation. Well, I'm afraid I don't share Nkweku's pessimism and, and frustration. No, I didn't, I'm not pessimist. Okay, frustration. Frustration. Yeah. frustration. I don't, I don't think that there's, there's anything, anything to be. I don't think there's 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 anything to be. This whole hoopla for me is needless. Can it be done before the elections? And if it is done before the elections, is it possible to have free and fair elections that will not degenerate into parliament? I say yes. If parliament has to sit for a week or two, in addition to their regular <coughs> sitting period, just so that this thing goes through, why should we be making such a big deal out of it? And why is it the first time in Ghana's history that a matter in court or someone has attempted to stop an institution of state from carrying out a certain responsibility? And nonetheless, parliament, being a master of its own rules, had gone ahead and done what it has to do. I don't think it's the first time. It won't be the last time. Again, it is clear from the cases that have gone to court, and indeed, I, I do not want to risk uh, be, being cited for contempt. But I don't believe that <laughs> I don't believe that those cases really are, are going anywhere. In light of the fact that the electoral commission has simply used the same processes, the same systems, the same calculations, the same formula that they used to create thirty constituencies in two thousand and four, and we didn't have any hula baloo about it, even no, if there was. We went to court. Yeah, but yes, but but, the, but, but the electoral commission went ahead nonetheless. No, Parliament did what it had to do. So why is it that if the same scenario is being played out, people should express such frustration and pessimism as though the country was on the brink of some disaster? I don't think that the, the, the issues are as serious as people are, are, are making them out to be. It will be done. It will go on peacefully. Again, I think that the MPP runs the risk of incurring the wrath of the many people in our society who are happy about these developments. You see, it is not in the interest of political parties to be seen to be doing things that are not in tandem with the aspirations of the people. I have been around a bit. I can assure you that people who are going to benefit from these demarcations, people in people, uh, places like Weja, Okan Kwe North, Ablekuma South, that are unwieldy because of their size, are extremely excited about the division that is coming. So mm -hmm. when the MPP behaves in a manner that shows that they are not in support of something that the people are clearly excited about. I think that they will suffer some political backlash if they do not retreat, regroup, and do the right thing. Again, it is, it is our time that we put away this unholy or if like unwholesome suspicion that we have of state institutions. Why would anybody doubt the integrity of the Electoral Commission? There is a commission that has held five elections. Of course, we've had our challenges, but everybody knows that those challenges did not emanate from a deliberate desire on the part of people at the EC to, 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 to manipulate them. But because our whole systemic our problems uh, came to the fore in those instances. But I don't think that anybody can doubt Dr. Faijan's integrity as far as upholding the system is concerned. But you think if, we can handle it better next time around? Well, of course, of course, we can learn lessons from this. But let us not play it out of context. Let us not exaggerate beyond the reality on it. I don't think that helps anybody. I don't know what that want me to comment on the mid-year mid budget. Yes, it's a quick look. Okay, okay. I, I think that basically the, the budget showed that the, the economic fundamentals were still robust. Inflation is still at single digit. Yeah, we suffered some hits with the uh, reserves for very obvious reasons. The dollar and all that has given us a normal effect. But the, where we are at the moment is certainly better, much, much better than where we were in 2008. Again, the, 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 the real GDP growth for the first, sec the, what do you call it? The first quarter of this year appears to be robust. We grew at 8.7% compared to, is it 4% in 2011? So it shows that we are making some significant progress, even as challenges still remain, especially with regards to wage issues. Uh, again, I heard comments from the minority to the effect that they thought that government was not prioritizing properly. Government <coughs> was more committed, in their view, to paying salaries of workers than investing in areas like agriculture. I, I, bet, I bet you differ. I don't think anybody can argue against the need for something to be done about the salaries of Ghanaian workers. And indeed, over the years, they have agitated for, for, for improved salaries. So I think that we all should be happy as a society that teachers, doctors, nurses, and other public sector workers are enjoying significant increases in their salary. That's the only way that we can spare productivity. Again, agreg, a lot has been done for agreg. 
look at the, the, the marvelous strides we've struck in the cocoa sector. Certainly could not have come about if the right investments were not made in fertilizer, cocoa spraying, and what have you. I mean, even agro processing, the share not factory that the vice president commissioned uh, earlier this year. It is a way in which we are trying to mitigate the suffering of, of our ladies who are involved in share not picking up not and others. So these are ways in which we can demonstrate clearly that something indeed has been done by rice production. I mean, a lot has been done in terms of interventions to spare local rice production, to cut down on the, on, on, and what do you call it, the, the huge deficit that we have in terms of rice production, which leads us to import huge quantities of Dr. rice. So I think that is not necessarily good. translating into a better life for Ghana. No, but if, if a teacher was earning much lower than he's earning now, certainly it would translate into a better life for him. A policeman was earning much lower than he's earning now. Certainly it would translate into a better life for him. I mean, the youth in a Greek project that we've launched, where young people who otherwise had no hope, were unemployed, have been given something to do, certainly will only translate into a better life because now they're able to earn income to look after their families. I think that, again, Dr. Indum has become synonymous with populist policy. I think he, he needs to move away from that. He, he was part of the MPP administration for eight years. He cannot distance himself and pretend Nana, that let me hear you. new problems have emerged that he's unaware of. Nana, let me hear you. Well, yeah, first of all, um, let me just say that I, I don't share the view that if you criticize the Electoral Commission, it means that you doubt their integrity. The Electoral Commission uh, has powers to exercise um, uh, in accordance with the Constitution. And um, where any person under the law or institution is given the powers of discretion, it is subject to challenge. The EC can make a mistake. So if somebody questions the EC's uh, policies or his, its actions, it doesn't mean that uh, they don't have any integrity. My understanding of the matters in Parliament, which is relating to the uh, constitutional instrument, is that it's one of timing. That's what I understand it to be. The, and, and also one of um, uh, fidelity to the rule of law. There is a court case pending at the Supreme Court on the very matter of the creation of constituencies. And therefore, I think the minority's view was that, look, we should not be touching this constitutional instrument with a 10-foot pole because it would uh, be undermine uh, the, the, the case in court. Now, Parliament being the, uh, a branch of government, um, it, is, it is not just an individual. And therefore, when it does things, it has more wider implications and much more powerful uh, implications than if an ordinary citizen were to even do something that goes against uh, something pending in court. And um, the Speaker took the position that um, the, 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 the rule against discussing or dealing with matters that are pending in court relates to debate and not to the laying of papers. But I think uh, I would beg to differ with her. I th it seems to me that the only purpose of laying a, a piece of paper in Parliament is to uh, enable debate and uh, an eventual um, either approval or disapproval. We're told when it comes to CIS and allies, it's laid, it goes to the you know, subsidiary they, they, committee, and then, you know, No, they debate it. They de well, if it goes to the subsidiary committee, there's a debate on it. And the subsidiary committee, the committee is just a committee of the whole, so they represent Parliament. That's the first point. The second point is that, what Parliament does not have the right to do is to amend the CI. They either reject it within the 21 days or it, it becomes law. That's what it is. So and they are, and in order to reject it, they have to debate it. Okay? So I think that's a, a semantic sort of uh, uh, excuse for allowing it to happen. Now, uh, uh, Felix also just mentioned that um, Parliament is the master of its own rules. That is very true. But Parliament uh, is a master of its own rules only to the extent that they don't offend the Constitution or the constitutional rules. It's not the old days when Parliament was supreme and it was sovereign and it could even overturn court judgments. That's gone. Today, it must act within the Constitution. And the rules are that if Parliament itself is aware that there is a matter in court that has to deal with something Parliament needs to deal with, it ought to really stay its hand and await. Uh, otherwise, it will be prejudging the matter. And this was already determined in the G.H. Mensa case. So there's no question at all about that uh, Parliament has to do that. The question is, again, one of timing, as I've said. If you look at it now, Parliament is going to rise uh, next week. It means that they have to recall Parliament in order to sit for 12 days because between now and when they have to rise, the thing would have been laid <coughs> for nine days. They have to come back, sit for 12 days, doing nothing except on this. At the earliest, we're talking about August. If we're talking about August, we're talking about then, if it becomes law, then people going out into the field, the political parties having to um, organize their party structures and then candidates would have really a, a month and a half to campaign. So, so, so it's unheard of. So you agree it also creates a murky situation. Best yes. way to deal with it? And the thing is, that, let me also say this. There's a comparison being made between this time and 2003, 2004. If you may recall, the 2004 um, uh, uh, amendments were made uh, or alterations were made uh, a year 
before the elections. So it was, it was, it was reasonable, okay? Now, uh, a one and a half months is unheard of in any jurisdiction to have So the best way to deal with it is? I think the best way to deal with it is not, is not to proceed know. with these uh, creations. There is a case that is very interesting, which I think was wrongly decided by the Supreme Court. It's called Luke Mensah versus the Attorney General. If you read, this is very important, uh, uh, if you read Article 47.6, it says that where the boundaries of a constituency established under this article are, are altered as a result of a review, the alteration shall come into effect upon the next dissolution of Parliament. Mm -hmm. Luke Mensah says, well, Parliament can have, uh, the EC can create the constituencies, we can have elections, but the parliamentarians cannot take their seats until the next dissolution of Parliament. That is not what it says. And in fact, in the Luke Mensah case, the Supreme Court, I, in my view, my humble view, they lack jurisdiction. And so I think that matter needs to be looked at again. The Supreme Court can always depart from its decisions. They can review and I think, their own decisions. I think it is an important article because in similar countries like ours, there's a, there's a constitutional prohibition against gerrymandering. So that when you alter constituencies, they cannot come into effect until the next election I cycle. I have to interrupt you at this point. I'm told that uh, Mr. Kujumpi, an informal chief of staff, uh, has uh, an interjection to make uh, you know, on the program right now. So let me go onto the phone lines and see if I can uh, have that conversation with him. I'm told we've lost him on that line. I will be uh, going to him when we do get him on that line. So yeah, let me just finish. wrap up for me. Yeah. Uh, so I think that, you see, because it, it makes good sense, Kojo, that so, uh, to, pr to prevent, because right now, you know, a lot of people are saying, and the EC appears to take the view, that once government has created districts, he's obliged to create uh, constituencies. That is a recipe for giving gerrymandering to power to executives. And to avoid that, Article 47.6 should have inter been interpreted as a, as a prevention of gerrymandering. And to say that, yes, EC, after a census, can, can, can review the constituencies. And if they alter them, they cannot come into effect until the next election cycle. Okay. Bidi Ako from BBNE says, whenever judgment debt contractors begin to present different versions of the same budget estimate, people must begin to put on their... Uh, glasses before six is turned to nine. Let me go back on the phone lines. Mr. Mpini, uh, uh, can you hear me? Good morning. Yes, I can. Good morning. And thank you for joining us. I understand you've got some uh, comments to make uh, on our discussion this morning. Let's hear you, sir. Actually, sir, I, I heard one, of, one or two of your panelists who were talking about these so-called judgment deaths and something like that. And some of them say, no, definitely, Kajum Pini, on the asset of phone, you should definitely be charged with uh, causing financial loss or something like that. And I felt I should come in. But unfortunately, when this whole uh, matter of uh, Asotofon came in, I, I was not in Ghana, so I didn't have the opportunity uh, to state my views on it. So I thought it's an opportunity for me, if you kind enough, to uh, allow me to uh, disabuse the minds of those who think that the propaganda being used by other people against me is right. Okay, I don't I have know, much time, but I'll be happy. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, you don't have further, but give me a bit. First and foremost, I want it to be clear that anything I did, I was not doing it as Columbian in person, but I, anything I did was acting on behalf of the government. That was the first thing. Secondly, the agreement uh, for this, uh, sorry, for this Spanish law was signed by the Minister of Finance on behalf of Ghana government. And the Minister of Finance was responsible for the implementation of that agreement. You know, if you will kind enough and give me two minutes, I'll read a letter from the Minister of Finance. If you have already read this letter or you know about this, you discuss it, then can you stop me in the course of my reading it? But if you have not, then can you allow me to read it? Because it summarizes the whole of this so-called isotophone uh, 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 case. So the letter is from the Minister of Finance and Planning to the Attorney General. And this is dated April 207, 30th April 207. The heading AVPV, Powered Pumping and Irrigation Systems in Remote Rural Area of Ghana under the Second Ghana Spanish Financial Protocol. We refer to a letter of 28 May 2007 in respect of the above reference subject. As requested, please find below our comments for your consideration and further action. Background. The Minister of Finance and Economic Planning on behalf of Ghana government signed a financial protocol with the government of Spain on 6 June 2006 in Madrid, Spain. 
as part of the economic and technical cooperation between the two countries. Under the protocol, the Spanish government agreed to provide concessional credit of 65 million euros to DOG for a two-year period for the development of social economic projects in Ghana. This credit would be sourced from the Spanish Development Aid Fund. The protocol is therefore a bilateral agreement between the two governments with terms and procedures to be adhered to in its implementation. Cabinet and Parliament gave approval to the protocol on 10th June and 1st August 2005, respectively. Approval of projects, companies to undertake projects. As per the agreed procedures under the protocol, Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, in consultation with government, approved the projects and companies to execute the projects. Among the approved projects was that of irrigation equipment, solar power pumps, to be implemented by the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. The company selected was in Katima in Dema of Spain. This was communicated to all beneficiary ministries and MFA, that is Ministry of Food and Agriculture, on 10th and 21st May 2006, respectively. Ministry of Finance dealing with beneficiary ministries. Following the signing of the protocol, Ofer held a series of meetings with representatives of the beneficiary ministries, including Minister of Food and Agriculture. The meetings discussed the processes involved in the implementation of the protocol and the expedition of the same. At the discussions, the procedures for implementation were clearly spread out, including in particular the contract award system to be adopted. Please see a couple of the minutes of the one such meeting. The following provisions of the protocol were emphasized for the attention of the beneficiary ministries. One, under clause one of the protocol, the project to be developed had to be agreed upon between the both governments and to be carried out by Spanish firms in the Republic of Ghana. Two, under clause seven of the protocol, agreements on facilities relative to the to the FAD, that the, the, the loan credits shall be signed on behalf of the government of the Republic of Ghana by the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning or a duly authorized representative. Three, on the award of the project under the protocol, it was agreed under clause two that GOG would source us the companies and undertake a value for money audit before approval is finally given by the Spanish authorities for the disbursement of the funds. So how does it connect to Isophoton? This is all what I'm reading is on Isophoton. So that's what I'm coming to. I'm almost at the end of it. But my understanding was that this was about the bigger protocol. Yes, and this letter is on, uh, on uh, Isophoton, uh, uh, or Ministry of Agriculture, uh, uh, or Isophoton's letter to Ministry of Agriculture, and then to authority they are saying that they were going to sue. Okay. So the ministry okay. decided to let the attorney general have the background of the whole thing. That's okay. what I'm reading to you. Okay, now I understand the background. Yes, yeah, the background. That's why I'm reading this to you. Okay, go ahead. For the beneficiary ministries were informed that the sole sourcing was at the discretion of government. Mr. Mpini, are you there? No, I think I've lost him on that line. Um, I had wanted him to finish, and then I was going to ask him, you know, some direct questions uh, from that. We're 26 after 11. Tell you what, I'll take a very quick break while we try to reason back on that line. And when we return, okay. we'll wrap up this conversation. George Entry says, uh, I'm wondering why the EC and the government are rushing to create new constituencies five months with the general elections. If the government feels strongly it will win the election, why not wait and create it after the election? Uh, Surakatu Sani says, I sense there's an attempt by the Electoral Commission to plunge this country into chaos. The EC must rethink its decision. It's indeed Sad. Do we have Mr. Mpini back on the line? Uh, Mr. Mpini is back with us on the line, and he's been reading to us a letter from the Finance Ministry, which was seeking to give a background to the framework governing, uh, you know, this facility between Spain and Ghana, under which this contract to Isophoton was granted. Am I right, sir? Yeah, you are right. Okay, so um, how does that exactly answer the basis on which we did that? Let me finish with that. The, the, next, the next idea is MFA. That means of food are a great dealings with isotopone. After Minister of Finance and Economic Planning informed the beneficiary ministries through a letter of March 206 on the Spanish company selected by government to execute the projects, Minister of uh, Agri wrote to Minister of Economic Planning by letter dated 4th April 
informing Ministry of Economic, Final Economic Planning of its dealings with Isophoto, resulting in the execution of a commercial contract on 22nd September 2005. Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning responded on 17th May to the fact that Ministry of Food and Agriculture action was contrary to government's position and the action had to be reviewed as the Spanish government had already been informed of government's position on the selection of Spanish companies. It's instructive to note that Minister of, Minister of Agric in his letter of 4th April 206 admitted in paragraph 2 of the letter that the beneficiary ministries were only to assist, quote, to identify, unquote, competent Spanish companies to execute the project and not to sign contracts with them. MFS contract of Isophoton could therefore not have been authorized or approved by Minister of Finance and Economic Planning or on behalf of government. In this regard, the contract cannot be valid as far as the procedures and terms of the protocol are concerned. It should also be noted that Minister of Finance and Economic Planning went further to notify the Spanish authorities by its letter of 17th May to only accept contract agreements executed in accordance with Clause 7 of the protocol and upon the approval of the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning. In short, Minister of Finance and Economic Planning did not select ISOFOTO to execute any project. And Minister of Food and Agriculture was not mandated by Minister of Finance and Economic Planning to sign a contract with ISOFOTO on behalf of DOG. I see, and so this is a basis on which yeah, the let, contract let me, was let abrogated. Final, let, can you let me read the final paragraph? And that will help us. I saw photons legal threat. From the above information, it's obvious that I saw photon had no case against GOG. Since GOG, Minister of Finance Government had not selected them to execute a project for no authorized Minister of Food and Agriculture to sign a contract with them. I saw photon indeed recognize the necessary approval of MOFEP in these matters, as clearly noted by Minister of Food and Agriculture in the co covering letter of 12 December 2005. In any case, assuming without admitting that MFS contract with Isophoton is valid, Article 26 of that contract, properly construed, indicates that the contract is only enforceable upon fulfillment of all the conditions precedent. Article 26 provides that, quote, this agreement shall enter into force when all the formalities set forth here, here, here under are fulfilled. It then proceeds to list these formalities, which include, one, all approvals by the relevant Ghanaian authorities have been obtained. Two, all approvals by Spanish authorities have been obtained. Unquote. From the foregoing, the obvious, it's obvious that these approvals have not been and will not be granted Form. On what basis can Asotofon therefore sue for breach of contract and claim damages? Okay. Let me finally say that somebody may ask, well, how did you come about uh, giving lists of names to the uh, Spanish authorities? We are in Ghana. We don't have these companies. We have to implement this project within two years. And therefore, you need to get a support to be able to identify companies. So what we did was to contact the Spanish authorities. And they gave a name of a company, which is an agent, agency of the, the Ministry of Trade. It's a part of something, something. <laughs> you can ask the, our embassy in, in Spain, or the ambassador who was then there, understand, has retired and is in Ghana, you can ask him. So we went to them and said, look, these are the projects we want to implement. Could you be kind enough to help us in selecting competent Spanish Company, you can help us to do this. And they brought us the list. Okay. And this was the list we sent to uh, the, 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 the Spanish authorities. Okay. So I've been wondering all this noise. A few, a few, a few, uh, a few follow-up questions, Mr. Mpini. Yes. If I yes. understand you clearly, you are saying there were two grounds. One, because the Ministry of uh, Food and Agriculture didn't have capacity to actually give that contract because under the protocol is a finance ministry that should be given the contract. And two, oh, we have a government. That, that is right. Okay. And two, in any case, even if that contract was valid, they didn't fulfill the conditions precedent under Article 26 of that contract. Of that contract. That's right. But 
in your submissions also, you told us that uh, the best that the Ministry of Food and Agriculture could have done was to have recommended companies for the finance let ministry they, to avoid the they, contract. They, they, they themselves in their letter accepted that that's what they were supposed to do. I see. So when eventually we gave this contract, or when eventually we realized that the contract, uh, uh, or it wasn't a valid, properly you know, given contract, uh, couldn't we take what they had done as just a recommendation and actually fulfill the process so that the finance ministry will give them the contract? Instead of giving it so to a we, new company. What I, what I said, let me repeat what I said, that we did not know these companies. And there were all manner of uh, Spanish companies coming here trying to convince us that they were the best. So what we did, what we did was to go to Spain through an embassy, contact the Ministry of Trade, and they have an agency. The agency is called Expansion, excuse my, my Spanish, a serial or something. And they asked them that, would you be kind enough to help us? to give us a list of Spanish companies which can implement these projects. And they came out with a list of Spanish companies, a list of Spanish companies they believe could, have, could do the, uh, the job. I see. And we accepted that list. And that's how we got so the second like, company? Something like Colombian is sitting in his office and saying company A in uh, Spain, come and do the work. I, don't, I didn't know any of them. Neither did any member of the committee who was handling this. The list came from Spain, from okay. an agency of the, of the sorry, Spanish government. Okay, and just so I understand you clearly, this is the list based on which you give the contract to a second company or to Isofoton in the first place? No, no, no. As a of all, we, did, we didn't do anything. It was something being done between the Ministry of Agriculture. We have been ah, okay. to either the Ministry of Finance or okay. the Cabinet. Okay, so subsequently, this uh, agency gave you a list of companies, and then you gave the contract to one of these companies listed That's right. on their list. That's right, because what we did was to, take, to tell this agency, these are the projects we want to implement under this protocol. Okay. We had kind enough to give us companies, competent companies who can do it. I see. And At the time... At the time that we re-awarded the contract, had Isophoton done any work in any way? They couldn't have done any work wow. <laughs> because we haven't even obtained the money. Okay, question uh, number so two. Go and do any work. Question number two. This letter that you are talking about was written in 2007, am I right? Yes. Um, did the Attorney General at the time proffer any views on this position being taken by the Finance Ministry at the time? And I'm asking because in 2008, the Attorney General writes to suggest... Uh, you know, that we didn't have a case? I don't think the Attorney General letter was in 2008. Uh, can you look at the date again? It's dated 4th of June 2008, under the signature of Joe Gatti, Attorney General and Minister of Justice at the time. Well, if it did, then I'm, uh, I'll be surprised about it, because this letter was addressed to the Attorney General. And actually, as a matter of fact, when I saw Attorney General, that letter you're referring to, I invited him and gave him all the facts wow. and asked him to contact the different ministries, collect the documents and read. It was then that he realized that he made a mistake. And I believe that was why even he went to court, when these people went to court to challenge them. I see. And so, um, as you explain, these were the reasons that, uh, you know, galvanized your decision and therefore um, you didn't do anything wrong. I have done nothing wrong. Nothing wrong. I hear you, Mr. Mpini. We'll leave it here. Thank you for joining us with your uh, thoughts this morning. 20 minutes uh, before we head, uh, 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 20 minutes before, gentlemen, take your time. Take your time, gentlemen. 20 minutes before we head 12. Here's what we're going to do. I know we have to move on to one other subject, but I'm sure because of his intervention, uh, I'm going to give you um, each a couple of minutes to quickly comment yeah. on it, and then we'll you know try and wrap up with our substantive uh, subject. Yeah, first of all, yeah, first of all, the claim by Mr. Mpini that the Ministry of Agriculture did not have capacity to engage companies to carry out the project is a bit strange. Can you that to award the contract? Award yeah. the contract again, again. The Ministry of Finance, sorry, the Ministry of Agriculture says here in their letter of 4th April 2006 that in all their meetings with the Ministry of Finance, they were made aware that they should identify companies yeah. that are best suited to carry out the project. They go on then to state that the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, after a diligent search, settled on two companies to execute the projects in the ministry. The two companies were Isofoton SA Madrid Spain and Race SA of Spain. Whilst Isofoton SA were to install solar-powered pumping and irrigation systems in the sum of 5 million euros, RESA was to supply irrigation equipment to the tune of 3 million euros. Find a target due diligence report in respect of Isofoton SA of Spain. The ministry, per the Honorable Minister, went further to 
enter, sorry, to enter into an agreement with Isophoton SA on 22nd September 2005. After advice from the Attorney General, okay. copy of the agreement is enclosed for your attention. Now listen, based on the agreement with Isophoton SA, since solar irrigation is a novelty in Ghana, it was decided that a pilot of the pumping system be tried and tested at a Simon before full-scale execution of the project. As a result, correspondence from Isofoton shows that they have gone ahead to source materials for the pilot scheme. The third letter of March 24, 2006 is enclosed for your attention. It is having regard to all that has transferred that the Honorable Minister for Food and Agriculture would want to draw your attention to the fact that a change of company at this stage could open up the ministry and indeed the government to legal action, especially by Sofoto. Felix, Again, hold it, hold it. Yeah. go back to your premise. You said yeah. the Ministry of Food and Agriculture mm -hmm. uh, at all times was operating with the instruction that they were to identify companies that were mm -hmm. suitable. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If I, I mean, if I understand you, that doesn't mean to a war. No, but you see, you see, I, listen, as, a, as, as was the case in the energy uh, aspect of this particular project, it was the ministry, the implementation agency, that was going to sign the contract with Isofoton or the, any company that they selected to execute the specific project under the specific ministry. Again, the Ministry of Agri went ahead to do But you see, the most interesting point is that Mr. Mpiani says that the Spanish government somehow was unhappy about Isofoton, or that the selection of companies was supposed to be done at the behest of the Spanish government, that the Spanish government was going to provide an agency jointly to do that. Jointly. Again, that is completely point. refuted by a letter that the Spanish government itself wrote, in which Isofoton petitioned them after their contract had been abrogated as of March 21st, 2006. The Spanish government wrote and said that no such agreement was in place, and that they had agreed at all times that the selection of companies to execute specific projects was within the domain of the Republic of Ghana. They even go on to express disquiet about the fact that companies that had been selected were, being, were having their contracts abrogated. Mm -hmm. So how does that tie in the explanation that Mr. Mpini is giving now? Mm -hmm. The Spanish government, the same government that Mr. Mpini is saying, objected to the use of isophoton. Or the same government whose whose, uh, what called call it, approval was not sought before Isofoton was selected. He's saying that we have absolutely nothing to do with the specific selection of the contract. Indeed, when you go to the protocol, the only requirement, as far as specific companies are concerned, is that the companies must be Spanish. There is no indication that the selection of companies has to be done by a Spanish agency. Mm. It is on that basis that Isofoton went to court. And indeed, when you read Jogate's letter, Jogate arrived at his decision based on correspondence that he received from the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. Indeed, his letter of 4th June 2008 was addressed to the Minister of Finance. It is inconceivable that the Minister of Finance that was going to seek a legal opinion would not apprise Mr. Gatti of, of, of these, what do you call it, uh, uh, developments. In any event, which, which agency of government selected in Katema for the agri project and selected Elecno? For the energy project, he which says, agency of government? He says he says they asked the Spanish agency to provide a list, and then uh, 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 my understanding, unless I'm wrong, is that the finance ministry then went ahead to yeah. yes. But the letter, the letter, the letter that uh, made in Katema the the company to be selected emanated from Mr. Kujumbi in office, chief of staff, not the Ministry of Finance. Hmm. So how do we how, how how do we explain that? He's saying that the Ministry of Finance is an agency of government that is supposed to enter so into contract or select con what do you call it companies to execute the project. Yet, the letter that was informing the Greek ministry that in Katema had been selected came from Mr. Kudum Pioni. It was under his signature, no, no. not from the finance no, no. ministry. Let me hear your yeah. comments. Well, I mean, the only comment I'll, I'll, I'll make on this matter, because I think Mr. Pioni has adequately explained what is happening. As far as whether the letter emanated from his office or the Ministry of Finance, I think everybody knows that the, ministry, the, the chief of staff uh, acting for the, on behalf of the president has oversight responsibility for all of the ministries. Well, the chief of but staff is not the ministry. Exactly. No, no, the the chief of staff is the minister the for presidential affairs. But that's in his not case, the ministry of finance. It's not the ministry of finance. I, 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 excuse me. What I'm saying but that the, the minister for finance. presidential affairs and the chief of staff is the alter ego of the president in terms of instructing other ministries. Certainly, that what everybody does it a bit different. Nana Tudazi and Jerry Rawlings, a bit different. And the President Kufo, I think we all know that if the president wanted to issue an instruction or to guide the ministries in the conduct of their work, it normally came under the pen of the chief of staff. Some, and so some, I'm saying some, that some, even if the ministry of- Some education here. I know for companies, for instance, companies are separate legal entities on yes, their own. Yes, so Ministries uh, are not separate legal entities. They are not. Of course not. Okay. No, they are, they are merely agents of the president. Okay. That's why I'm saying no, this. No, no, just excuse me. I, I, I do not intend to heckle you. Now, Mr. Mpini is saying that the reason why Isofoton's contract would not have been valid, that is if his view is to be upheld, was that the wrong agency 
and being the Ministry of Agri had yeah. entered into the contract. In other breath, the letter that was indicating that Inkatema had been selected came from the Chief of Staff yeah. Office, not from the Ministry of, of Finance. Agri Finance. How do you reconcile the I'm two saying that in any case, the president is the Ministry of Finance. He is the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. That is the, uh, the system we operate in this country. The president is the minister of everything. That is the fact. You understand me? So if it comes from the president, but you know what is interesting is this. It is unclear to me, based purely on contract, and uh, Felix has been kind enough to have me borrow his, his document. This letter from Clement, a lady, the mini deputy minister for Food and Agriculture, and he says, based on the agreement with Isofoton SA, since solar irrigation is a novelty in Ghana, it was decided that a pilot of the pumping system be tried and tested at Ashaiman before full-scale execution of the process. As a result, correspondence from Isofo Tofon shows that they have gone ahead to source materials for the pilot scheme. The said letter of March 24th, 206 has been closed. What this says to me is that continuation of the project or implementation of the project would depend on the outcome of the pilot. Okay? Now, this was also known to Isofoton. So that if indeed Isotophoton procured materials based on that understanding and they, they, they went ahead uh, in, order, in order to implement the pilot scheme and yet the contract was terminated for whatever reason, I think Isotophoton would be entitled to some um, um, compensation for that uh, expenditure, uh, you understand me, but not for the benefit of the contract. Mm. Uh, and this is b based purely on, on what is here and my understanding of, 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 of the of the events relating to no, Isofoton. No, the more important point. point is that what uh, um, Kojo Mpieni is saying is no different from the government's own advice. That's what strikes me as odd. And that's why I'm surprised with Felix's uh, position. Because the professional group that was paid thousands of dollars in order to look into this matter and produce a research and field study on the Isofoton case comes to the conclusion that Isofoton has no basis in contract to sue. And this is no different from what the Mr. position of Mr. Mr. Well, Mr. 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 It is instructive to note that this uh, research group, that yeah. Nana, and indeed I've heard other members of the MPP refer to it, that matter was tested in court by Baitan It was one of the main planks upon which he went to court to challenge or to seek but to set aside the report the that was before that. Yeah, but he summarized, listen, listen. <laughs> he summarized the content of the yeah. report. It, indeed, he sent a memo to the solicitor general summarizing the content of the report. So he took that to court to demonstrate that indeed Isofoton was in error, the contract was in error. The court threw that out. Okay. So hold they it. cannot hold seek it. refuge. I'm going to come to Muta Lai to quickly. Mr. Mpini is still with us on the line. He says he just wants some 30 more He's seconds to make a, a quick comment. Um, Mr. Mpini? Mr. Mpini, can you hear me? But they bet you call into okay. the program. Okay. She doesn't need to call. But she didn't call into the program. First and foremost, what you are saying doesn't make sense. Please, please, please. No, 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 no in a special group to investigate blah blah their report just last week my senior brother here was talking about quoting about 520,000 Ghana cities it turned out to be less than that just once which was paid but because references of letters were made and statement made by by the former attorney general Martina, Martina Miru, that became the whole truth they were rushing from one station to another there is one point that must be made I think that what Kujun Pienim is struggling to do more or less to appeal to the to the, 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 the emotions of Ghanaians. That is what he precisely is doing. And to gain the sympathy, why? He said that he was not acting as an individual. He was acting on behalf of the government of Ghana. Betty Moli Drusu never acted as individual as it's the Minister of Justice. About. Please, I'm coming. Betty Moli Drusu also acted. I'm saying that he also, she also acted on behalf of the government of Ghana. Yet you had people who went to town calling her all sorts of names. And I think that we need to be fair. Why? The letter that he just read, now, when you drew his, his attention to a letter that was written dated 4th June 2008, he said he is not too sure whether the letter was written 4th June. You have the letter here. It is here before, before us. That is one year, two months. So it's the chief of, uh, former chief of staff telling us that for one year, two months, 14 months, he wasn't aware. The Minister of Justice was not aware that the Minister of Agriculture had entered into and or signed a contract with the company that was illegally done based on the protocol with the Spanish government. 
Because clearly he's trying to tell us that the ministry, per the protocol, Ministry of Agri didn't have the right, the capacity to sign any contract with any company. Now, one year, two months, then I wonder the kind of government we had in this country. At that time, 14 solid months, they didn't know. Now, if you read this letter, <laughs> if you read this letter, and I wouldn't, this letter which was written by Joe Gatti, 4th June 2008, I will not read the entire letter, but I'll just read a part of it, that we have studied, and the Joe Gatti was actually writing to Minister of Finance, that we have studied your letter and the various documents submitted by your ministry and Minister of Agri, and advise as follows, that there is a breach of binding contract with Isotophone SA, which entitles them to special damages, general damages, and interest at the prevailing bank rate from time of breach till the date of payment. We further advise that you, any lawsuit arising out of this matter would be detrimental to the government. The simple point. Minister of Justice, the legal advisor of government at that time, for one year, two months, another ministry entered into, into an illegal contract with Isotophone. You were not aware. The Minister of Justice was never informed. The government was never informed. The Minister of Agri was never informed. Now, your attention was drawn to the fact that the Minister of Finance wrote to you indicating that they had abrogated that contract and, and they gave it to, to another. Just, just a, if, you, if you let me a minute. Yeah. The Minister of Agri, by a letter dated 4th April 2006, again, an address to the Minister for Finance and Economic Planning, states clearly that in 2005, 22nd September 2005, when the contract was being signed, the input of the Attorney General had been sought. Exactly. So the Attorney General was aware. Oh, that so, so let me go to Mr. Mpini, who is back with us on the line. Mr. Mpini, I understand you, you want to have a very quick statement, and then I'll come wrap up here in the studio. Mr. Patro, or whatever the name is, I was referring to a letter I wrote, what in the letter? Have you been holding that letter, a copy of that letter? Of course, If yes. you read it, the yeah. first letter, you see that, I was acting on behalf of a committee, and it's Which? clearly stated in that letter. So it was a letter which I sat in my office, and it was a committee decision, which I communicated to all the departments. Secondly, secondly, uh, the gentleman who just spoke was referring to, so if you are an attorney general, and you take a decision, some decision now, and some matters come before you later, because you take anything now, you can't change your mind. That's what they are trying to tell us. Why did he go to court then? If he still stood by that, why did he advise the government that you don't have a case, but he went to court? And also, finally, I drew the attention the letter I read. That by that agreement they are talking about, assuming, assuming, without admitting, that, that that was an agreement. That same agreement stated that it would come into effect after approval by the two governments. Which Ghanaian government approved it? Ask them which government approved it. That agreement which they are holding, which is the basis for Ash of uh, 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 court uh, issue. But In isn't, that agreement, isn't the two parties signed that that agreement will come into effect, among other things, after the two governments have approved. So, and our government is saying that we don't approve of it. Yes, but... So what, is the, what, 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 what are they talking about? What's the definition of government here? The Ministry of Food and Agriculture, sir, is an agency of government. Which... which and the, 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 the protocol states that the Ministry of Finance and Planning acts on behalf of government. That's what is their protocol. Okay, so... Food and Agriculture cannot so, write to, 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 to the... To the uh, to, to, to the finance authorities, they wouldn't even, and even the Ministry of uh, uh, Finance wrote to even to the, the, the finance authority that they should discard, disregard any letter coming from any other source except the Ministry of Finance and Corona Planning. A quick question before you go. So the first contract was invalid because it was, you know, entered into by the Ministry of Food and Agriculture. Who signed the second contract with a, you know, new company? I'm not aware. Wow. I, I believe it. I believe it. It's not signed by the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. I know. I believe what I was supposed to do. I left it there. Okay. The other department has to take it on from there. Okay. And I believe I'm not aware. I believe it's not signed by the Ministry of Finance and Economic Planning. Okay. 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 Felix just read, indicated that the input of the Ministry of Justice and Attorney General was actually taken when they were signing this contract. Yet the same minister, on the 4th of June 2008, in response to the breach of that contract or giving the contract to another company, indicating to Minister of Finance and Minister of Agri that what they were doing was wrong. 
he might have studied. In fact, I believe he looked at the entire document, the reasons, the, the justification for the abrogation of the contract, which he claimed there wasn't any contract and wrote this letter. Now, if you sit here and then you tell us that what they did was illegal, they didn't have the... Then Is I wonder the kind of Joe government Gatti they were was running. responding to Joe a letter Gatti from the Ministry of Finance. From, to, yes, from the Ministry of Finance. It means that the Ministry of Finance was well aware Quigo. of everything that was happening. Quigo, I'll give you the final four minutes. Let's brother, bottom line, the professional group report... It was not that, that which was put before the court yes. for adjudication. The legitimacy of this <laughs> report was not an issue before the court. And the other point we made was that for a government to have commissioned this and used the taxpayers' money to pay for 520,000 Ghana cities. That was what you put. Yeah. I'm Let ignoring you point. with contempt. Let him make this point. Are you aware that there was an interim report? I am ignoring you. We don't have oh, so you? No, 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 we have no, no, not you. Uh, uh, so <laughs> we have just about three minutes to wrap up. Quick, make your point. <laughs> it was the fact that a government sets up a commission, <laughs> commissions a group to issue a report, to investigate an issue, and did not wait for it, but went into settlement and filed a consent judgment. The preemptive approach that the government adopted was one issue we raised relative to the fact that was also paid for. Now, this report, this executive summary, there are two lines. It says, while Asufotone's SA contracts were to be founded under the second uh, Ghana Spanish protocol, the contracts do not, this is the government's position, do not satisfy the terms and conditions laid down in the protocol. For example, the contracts with the ministries of energy and food and agriculture were signed by the respective ministries instead of the Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, as required in the protocol. It no, again, coincides again, with again, that is a problematic. Clause 7 says the Minister of Finance or <sighs> his duly authorized Minister. representative See. From, from the Ministry no, of Finance. Yeah, yes, 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 and, and in this, this report, that's what and, it and in this, this report, and in this, this report, authorized representative. <laughs> indeed, this report <laughs> also <laughs> says <laughs> there was no... Duly authorized minister power of Gentlemen, gentlemen, we've just got two minutes to wrap up. We've got two minutes to wrap up. Nana, we've got two minutes to wrap up. And this report goes further to say that there was no record that the Ministry of Finance had ceded its authority to those two ministries Precisely. to sign that document as required do by the protocol. And indeed, they go further huh, to say a commercial contract is considered complete when issues to be considered are disclosed and or defined in full, eliminating any element of doubts, uncertainties, and ambiguities. A close study of the contract signed with Asofoton Clare clearly shows that the only undisputable components were the contract cost. So the then they gave a long list. Of what what the yeah, the last one. In the absence of the detailed facts, the Asofoton SA contract, which though had been signed, cannot be described as a document uh -huh. that can be considered as an appropriate commercial agreement. This you. is this government's own yeah, position. Which report? I, I want to thank our producers, so our cameramen, our staff.